It's a country where, uh, you know, the last four and a half decades, regime has been changed, flags has changed, and too much uh, chaos has been done to the country. Anything is possible over there. Name it from corruption to killing, assassinations and murder, kidnapping, smuggling, anything is possible. When I was a child, we played in the Russian tanks. I saw my um, f little friends that they step on the landmines and they are no more uh, on this world. And I had to leave my country because of Taliban. Every time when Chad or Dan or other friends, they would call me or text me, I was putting the phone in the loudspeakers to give the feeling for my daughters and my wife that my brothers are coming. They're not going to leave us alone. But, uh, you know, the five days was uh, worse than as hell. Welcome to Mic Drop. The podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Uh, triple ho, everybody out there. It's uh, Christmas. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas uh, from all of us here at Mike Drop because there is a team uh, that makes this show possible. Um, I, I want to kind of close the year out by saying thank you. You guys have shown uh, an overwhelming amount of support. Uh, to me and all of my guests, and uh, and I can't thank you enough. If it weren't for you guys, I wouldn't be able to bring you uh, the incredible stories such as the ones you're about to hear now. Uh, and I just want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Uh, spend that time with your family, not arguing about politics, and uh, and just enjoy the time, close the year out in a, in a safe and, uh, and family-friendly manner where everybody gets along and uh, doesn't choke themselves too much. So uh, on behalf of all of here, all of us here at Mike Drop, I want to say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, uh, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome back uh, to the podcast as well as introduce a new guest. Uh, we've already done the intro on Chad Robichaux, uh, so we're going to forego that, uh, but he brought uh, his interpreter, Aziz, to which uh, he just wrote a new book called Saving Aziz, and this is Aziz from the book. Uh, he was a JSOC interpreter from 2002 to 2016 in Afghanistan, working heavily with our uh, special operations forces, in particular with Chad and, and all of the different crazy shit that he had going on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Chad Robichaux and Aziz. Thanks, man. Thanks for having us back on. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I want to first and foremost say welcome uh, both to the, to the show and to the United States. You've been here for a little while now. Uh, but I'm curious to get uh, kind of from your take, uh, how, how are things now that you're here? Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a been, it's been a big change for the whole family. Uh, uh, kids are happy. They are out of danger now. They're uh, living the life very safely. Kids are going to school. They're uh, really, really happy. We had a really horrible time in Afghanistan, uh, especially... Uh, during the uh, uh, when the government collapsed, the five days it was like the end of the world for us. Yeah, but it's been a very um, a big change here, and things are working really nice and neat, and everything is all set. And Chad's been <laughs> Chad and the whole team of Mighty Oaks yeah. been uh, yeah. really great to us. Yeah, I mean, you know, from the chat that we had when he was on here, uh, you know, the last time and, and just kind of following what Mighty Oaks has done, it's uh, it's really, really impressive to see the, the work that you guys do and continue to do, uh, especially uh, with all of our counterparts in Afghanistan. I'm curious um, if, if kind of collectively the two of you could kind of walk us through that last few days and, and your correspondence and kind of how... how the logistics came together and how dicey it was because, you know, from the bits and pieces that I've gathered from hearing you talk and on other shows or just, uh, you know, looking at some excerpts and, and going through the book, um, it, it's pretty, pretty uh, harrowing and incredible, uh, the, the journey and, and your guys' ability to get him out of there. And, and it almost didn't happen. I mean, no. uh, so I, I'd love to just kind of turn it over to you guys to tell that story collectively. Yeah, I think there's a a part that I hadn't told publicly yet is in the book, um, but you know, you're more, more long form podcast, and I don't feel a little more comfortable talking about it here. But 
when we were working, you know, I, I did all eight of my deployments. Aziz was started off as my interpreter, then he became my teammate, and then he became the guy that I worked in pretty much in Singleton, but uh, meaning working by myself, doing advanced force operations for my unit to go and build all the clandestine logistics to put our assaulters on target to capture, kill bad guys in the mountains of Afghanistan, across the border in Pakistan. Uh, so I would do that with Aziz as, as my interpreter, my teammate, and cultural advisor, everything. And, uh, and in those eight deployments, um, we had a bunch of other Afghans that worked with us. Most of them were OGA trained uh, to do certain jobs that were with us. And there was one guy, uh, his name was Bashir, who uh, flipped to the Taliban. I don't know why he flipped to the Taliban, but he did. And uh, during that time, uh, several, uh, a good number of our Afghan counterparts were captured, killed. Um, they drove a, a V-bid uh, into my house, vehicle ID into my house to try to kill me and my friends and, and blew up our house. Uh, he had a plan to kidnap some of us. I, I ultimately was abducted by a foreign aid intelligence agency because of that. No shit. Uh, yeah. Which one? Can you say? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> I, I can tell you when yeah. when this is off. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in, in fact, it's in the book, but it's redacted in the book. Oh, I got you. They, uh, Man, that's that's, that's, because it's redacted in the book, I probably shouldn't yeah. say. Um, and then... Um, well, the book's out, so, you know, you can say now. And <laughs> yeah. 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 What are they going to do? Take it back? No, I'm going <laughs> uh, to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does, uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Yeah, the, right. the Pentagon held that book for five months and, wow. and did the redactions on it. Most of the redactions were from our previous stuff. Yeah. But so this guy Bashir, our our, our unit, and, you know, the unit went out and, and, and got him, caught him, and uh, and but he was after Aziz and his family and knew who Aziz was and what he did, and so he spent time in Bagram Jail, and then during uh, the release, Aziz, you know, when he was he was sent yeah. to. He spent a few months in Bagram jail then uh, through the Afghan senators. His father uh, and family facilitated and brought him to the Pulicherokee jail, the Afghan government jail, and then he spent like six years over there. After that, um, he was uh, removed from the jail and sent to Saudi Arabia. As soon as uh, the Haqqani network take over Afghanistan, uh, especially the uh, south uh, eastern bar, uh, provinces, he came back uh, and joined the Haqqani Network. He's a very big, uh, popular commander of the Haqqani Network. He's having lots of guys, uh, soldiers, Taliban guys under him. And uh, when he uh, came back, he told the drivers, the ex-drivers like Tota Khil and the other guys, yeah. that he was coming uh, to get me. He was looking for my number from them. And Tota Khil called me, he told me that I have to leave immediately, wherever uh, I am, because he's coming and he's looking and capturing all this, the guys. This is fast forward to, to now, like, yeah. so he, get, he gets out, he's back, and now the withdrawal is starting to happen, people are moving in, uh, you know, unless this is like, you know, like June uh, time frame, they're looking for him. And so, wow. you know, for me, like, in communication with him, when President, when President Biden said we're doing the withdrawal, I had already had him in the SIV interpreter process to get his visa for six years. I mean, he, you said, you know, he, uh, all those years with, you know, almost, almost 15 years with, with, with in special operations, polygraphed, access to TS clearance. We, it took six years. I mean, the process was supposed to take nine months. So I had, and I know a lot of people in Congress and Senate that was trying to get him through. So if that process wasn't, didn't happen then, I'm like, man, it's not going to happen. And, uh, and so we're, we started talking and he started moving his family to, to hide from Bashir. So for me, I'm like my friend Aziz who saved my life on numerous occasions, uh, probably every day I've, I've witnessed him put his life in harm's way to go, uh, QRF and save Navy SEALs that were trapped and needed help. And like, this is my friend and he's a good dude and he's put his life on the line for me. Like 
I can't leave him there. And so like, it's just killing me knowing that he's probably going to be caught and killed by Bashir, this, you know, mutual enemy of ours yeah. uh, that we used to work with. Um, who's a pretty sharp dude and a, and a violent dude. I've, I've seen him on, the, on our team before. Yeah. He's a violent guy. And, uh, and he's going to go on after Aziz. And I'm like, man, it's, it started. I was really, I, at the time, I'm like, I was scared. Yeah. I was worried for him. Um, is there a, a rhyme or reason or, you know, as, as the, the process kind of uh, escalated there uh, in those final days, the, the decision that different Afghanis made to either – side with the Taliban or try to escape. Um, I, I can only assume what, what kind of drove your decision-making process, but in particular, a guy like Bashir, do you know what drove him to say, fuck, fuck that. I'm going to go with, uh, with the Haqqani network and, and you know, the, the bad guys, so to speak. I mean, first of all, uh, he was from Kaust province, uh, which is, uh, farly related to the Haqqani network, that province, and uh, his closeness, his family's closeness with the Haqqani network, it could be one of the influences on him directly because uh, when he was working for us, he was dispatched to go to Pakistan. He had his free time. He was going and visiting all these bad guys uh, from his um, relatives that worked directly for the Haqqani network. And because of the uh, relationship between the families, I guess uh, that uh, directly influenced him to flip over and compromise with the bad guys. On the other hand, uh, he was a greedy man. As I was seeing him from day one, he was uh, trying to make a business, like make more money out of us, kind of like rape us off. Uh, because the operation we did uh, during that time, uh, there was lots of uh, opportunities for Afghan businessmen who could easily come and you know get the contracts from us, and um, you know on one hand provide all the logistics and supply and uh, transportation and support for our business operation. On the other hand, they could make some money. And when he was seeing this, he was getting greedier every day. He was getting greedy. And he uh, even directly a few times asked uh, my American colleagues to give him the contracts, why they are giving it to the somebody else, but not him. And then he was told that because he's uh, one of the guys that he needs to be working directly among the team, not you know as a businessman, because then there will be conflict of interest. And uh, one time I even remember that uh, he got mad at uh, Martin Robinson. Uh, he was uh, the transportation manager. Um, he threw his phone at him. And right after that, like a couple of weeks after that, we were uh, the witness of uh, the truck and the drivers yeah. that were seized by the Taliban. Wow. Yeah, when they, caught, when they caught him, he had like a map of like our house, like where I was sleeping, our times that we leave, oh, where our shit. safes were. He had like everything li li you know, lined yeah. out. Like a, and yeah, so he was, uh, so he, I mean, he was how, collecting the whole time. Do you know how, like from a, a number of days standpoint, how close he was to executing that? Yeah, I, I don't. A couple of days? I, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, because that, that's just what he had on him. Yeah. Um, you know, when he, when he got caught, you know, when I, I don't think, I think the Taliban at some point probably – cornered him i think he was probably feeding him information and at some point they they cornered him and made him uh, a yeah. compromise one of our operations which was all of our our the afghan guys got rolled up Man. and uh and some of them killed but uh yeah I don't, I don't know when he would have executed on us and our guys yeah so uh, where so where is we, he now He's, we were we're a big financial target i yeah. mean like all the time like our, our biggest our biggest like as a afos like working single 10 people are like and you're not scared going there by yourself and getting killed. I, I felt safer doing that than it would be, you know, driving around in Humvees in a camouflage uniform. Like yeah. you get it, you kind of know how to move around. He keeps me safe. Yeah. But where we, our biggest threat was because we were beard. spending so much money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got I mean, the, with a mustache the, 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 like that, the, you're the, fitting right. Yeah. In. Just like, uh, you, you've seen a, uh, team America, the, yeah. the little Muppets, He's in, <laughs> the little, the little brown face, uh, yeah. face paint on. You're good. <laughs> No, it was, it was it was the 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 threat of money. I mean, uh, I talk about Z saved my life, and there was one time we were uh, we were buying guns, and uh, and the reason we were buying guns was because we I would do all the E and E plans, the escape uh, plans, invasion plans, the contingencies for operations. So we build all the safe houses, and uh, all the safe houses would have hard rooms. We'd have you know like weapons, like local national weapons, so AK forty sevens and PKMs, and 
you know, uh, all the local grenades and ammo and RPGs and blood and medical equipment, just everything close. And so we, we, me and Aziz would stock these houses and, and we, so we had to go buy guns from locals. Usually we're Taliban that we we're buying the guns from. Wow. And, uh, and there was a, before me, there was a, a team guy who was, a uh, I won't say his name cause, uh, cause, um, uh, cause I wasn't happy that he did this, but he really, he was really kind of a bonehead to be honest with you. And he, he, he really was doing things that set him up to be a victim of a robbery. And, uh, and I think these guys were going to rob him and Aziz picked up on it. It was like, Hey man, they think it's this guy that's going instead of you. And when you get there, I, I think they're going to set you up and rob you and kill you. And so yeah. Aziz like call, call, he called it, man. And uh, we got, so we ended up going with four of us instead of just me, Aziz, myself, Dano, and this guy Bank. And uh, when we got in this like mud compound, we had his SUV is open. We're looking at the, a PKM and RPG and some AKs and, and, uh, and, and me and Dan are talking to this guy and, and I hear Aziz yelling and Aziz and Bank are over the mud wall and have, I can see them, they're, they're pointing their guns at, at, at something I couldn't see over the wall. And the guy starts saying, hey, don't hurt them, they're my friends. And we're like, how do you know who they are, right? Yeah. And he's like, he's like, those are my friends, those are my friends. And uh, he had set us up. And so Dan grabs him, sticks a pistol in his ribs. Uh, we go over, Aziz and them, had my gu- the guys couldn't get out of the car because they had him at gunpoint. Took the guys out of the car, we zip tied him up, moved the car out of the way threw their keys out in the field and, uh, and took this guy with us. And Bank was in the back of the car. Bank's yeah. like, because the guy kept crying. Like, he was telling Aziz, tell them not to kill me. Yeah. And Bank couldn't understand Dory. So Bank's like, what's he saying? Tell him to shut up. I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> He's like panicking. And yeah. we ended up, you know, kicking the guy out of the car and, and went to the elder of the village and told him they tried to rob us and never seen from that guy again. But, oh, but that was a threat all the time was we we're spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash everywhere. Yeah. And so... People wanted money, and and, and so uh, during that time, I mean, from a from a cash amount and transaction, both uh, amounts and how often, how did that shake out? Like, how, how much? I mean, you say hundreds of thousands, but I mean, is that pretty normal? Where you've got duffel bags with several hundred thousand dollars, and you're buying buying weapons from the Taliban, and and where are those weapons going to Afghan guys or? No, there was, the weapons we were buying were getting uh, stockpiled in our safe houses for our, our squadron guys oh, okay. in, in, the, in the event they needed them for local national weapons or for E&E contingencies if they had to, you know, hunker down and fight. The, the Those weapons that you're buying from the Taliban, where are they originating from? Do you know? Were they Russian, Chinese? Yeah, Russian. They're yeah. crates. Uh, yes, Russians, Iranians, and some are fake Pakistani, like those microwaves yeah. that the barrels came off. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, they're all mixed up. They come uh, even from Ukraine. They buy it. They bring it. There's uh, there are smugglers, Afghan smugglers, Iranians, Pakistanians, and the Baluchi guys. They bring them and store them in the four provinces of Afghanistan in the containers, and then you know, using these individuals, they sell them to NGOs, UN, and even the government sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, it's crazy to think about that. You know, from kind of a big picture standpoint, Am- American dollars are purchasing. Russian, uh, we were we were buying like, a lot of them. Yeah, uh, like I mean, the ballpark number of of how many weapons were purchased under your uh, watch. It was for different sites. Uh, for each sites, at least we had like six, seven guns, uh, long guns and small guns. Yeah. I'd, and I'd we had I'd, many different sites. Yeah. I, I probably personally purchased at least probably two hundred AKs, and uh, and that's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, no, I thought you mean like spending money, like. Like when I was, I was talking in general, like, like hundreds of thousands of dollars I'm spending on houses and oh, cars and, 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 yeah. you know, oh, so you're, yeah, you're kind yeah. of uh, the full ad bond yeah. Pay, yeah. paying for everything. Yeah. 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 But yeah, guns, probably, probably, you know, well over hundred, 200 AKs, yeah. probably a dozen PKMs, RPGs and just stockpiling those, those safe houses. Oh. And then from our, our own, cause I carry, I would not carry USG guns because I'll get caught with them. Yeah. So what I were carry, you normally carrying? AKS. Yeah. Yeah. A Russian one or a Russian AKS, yeah. yeah. Did you shoot it much? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, they always got to pull back on the magazine, yeah, because uh, they'll they'll jam up. So like <laughs> instead of like a like a forward handle, like the yeah. kind of like the uh, you know the brumstick handle, you grab the magazine and pull on it. Also, they jam yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is is it possible to take uh, shit like that over there? That like you know, there's the the Yugoslavian AKs, like the Cranks, the M- M92, I think. Uh, like those are really well made, you know, some yeah. of the Eastern Bloc uh, AKs are, are pretty, pretty stout. Is that not, uh, I mean, just out of my own curiosity, like, is that even a, a, a possibility to like funnel actually pretty well made weapons uh, that, but that aren't United States weapons in there? 
yeah, I, I don't know, you know, if, if it could have been done, it probably could have been done where I was working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, if, 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 and, you know, if it could have been done, it would have been done there. I, I don't yeah. know. I never, 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 never asked to do yeah. it. I mean, I, yeah, that's wild, man. Those, um, from, from a corruption standpoint, um, I know it's, I mean, fuck, it's here in the United States. It's everywhere. But how, how big of a problem did that play in both getting you out and, and the operations that you guys were trying to conduct, um, fighting corruption? And, and like the uh, Bashir guy, you know, was he making a shitload of money on the side, kind of playing all, all sides? Or how, how does that shake out? I mean, if it wasn't for corruption there, I, don't th- yeah. I, I, could, I couldn't have got my job done. Yeah. The corruption was in our favor. <laughs> yeah. This guy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> business facilitation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we couldn't call it corruption. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no backsheesh goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no backsheesh, no progress. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a country where, uh, you know, the last four and a half decades, regime has been changed, flags has changed, and too much uh, chaos has been done to the country. So because of that, uh, I mean, I, I, anything is possible over there. Yeah. You name it from corruption <laughs> to, you know, killing, assassinations and murder, kidnapping, yeah. smuggling, anything is possible over there. I so, mean, you know, for yeah. us to get like legit, build a le- the clandestine logistical infrastructure to, you know, put our guys on target in different places. We, you know, in Afghanistan, every province has a different, so if you like here, you get a car registered. Uh, this in a, in, a, in a state, your car could go anywhere. Like yeah. in, in Afghanistan, it can't. Like you have to have permits and a different license plate. Like you drive in the wrong town with the wrong license plate, people know you're not from there. Yeah. So you have to have all the right paperwork and and to be able to make through checkpoints and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, you know, that was part of Aziz's job. Was like, hey, we're going to be doing an operation here. These are the vehicles we need. We need them registered to someone. We need the right license plates. We need the right permits. And all that had to be done in advance before we get on target. And that shit only somebody like you are, are going to know, I can't right? Do it, yeah. 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 So f- from having grown up there, I'd like to spend a minute uh, talking about kind of your backstory of, of where in the country you're from and, and even what your childhood was like. Like what, what was your path prior to the United States showing up? Uh, I was born in uh, Kabul. Uh, and I was raised also in Kabul province. Um, when I was a child, we played in the Russian tanks. We took off parts from the leftovers of the Russian um, uh, military equipments and tanks. I saw my um, f- little friends that they step on the landmines and they are no more uh, wow. on this world. And, uh, you know, there was a time that we were all playing. We were playing uh, this game, the Walnut Games. We were... Uh, um, and uh, I saw my friend Kayumi. Uh, the next day, I saw his family that they are all crying in the neighborhood. Everyone is crying, and I'm like, "Where is Kayumi?" They're like, "He's dead. He's no more." And I saw his dead body. That you know, his legs were cut, his hands were cut. So I saw all kinds of uh, ups and downs uh, while growing in Afghanistan. Lots of regime changes, lots of conflicts uh, during the civil wars. I was also there, and. Uh, 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 one of the things that uh, the best things that I've done in my life is that I taught myself to self um, learn English language because there was a say in Afghanistan that uh, there is a pipeline coming from uh, Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, then going to Pakistan, Iran, and India, and they will need interpreters for the future. So I went to these stationary uh, bookstores. I found uh, uh, these uh, self learning uh, books that had the uh, English sentence and then the pronunciation by my own native language and then the meaning and then as I was speaking up uh, on the street this is like eight years old right yeah <laughs> and uh, so all these neighbor children they're like hey what are you talking are you crazy well I'm like this is English language this is an international language if you learn it in the future you will have a good job and uh, all different things so they asked me to teach them too so I ended up training about 800 uh, students in Afghanistan I also <coughs> voluntarily worked for the Afghan Red Cross uh, Society helping the um, people uh, who were victims of civil wars like uh, I have seen rockets mortar shells uh, exploded right in front of me in the street I have seen children in bloodshed and um, The overall of uh, growing in Afghanistan is uh, not much good. (laughs) It's all, you know, uh, bloodshed, seeing, and very uh, hard and difficult experiences in my life. 
And uh, it was around 1999 that when I was teaching English in my uh, private uh, English course, I had about 800 students. I was using my classmates as uh, teachers and also myself. And uh, it was one of the afternoons that the, it was the last black era of the Taliban that uh, they, they had a group, they call it the vice and virtue. So according to the Muslim community, they are supposed to pray five times a day. And every prayer's time, they need to close all the businesses, especially the front streets. They need to go to the mosque and perform the prayers. And that afternoon, uh, I didn't close uh, my course because students uh, asked me to continue with the lesson. We had a grammar and conversation mix class. And um, they told me to just, you know, uh, pull the curtains and we will continue. But I don't know, somehow they noticed this group of the, the Taliban. They came upstairs in the second floor and they tried to hit me with this cable. And I grabbed his cable, I punched him on, the, on his face. And then I saw that the other one is at the corner. He's trying to shoot me with his gun. I ended up jumping from the second floor. I ran away to the neighbor's house. And uh, how, how old were you at this time? I point? was uh, in my uh, 16s, probably yeah. 16s and 17s, something like that. So I ran away to the uh, neighbor's house, not knowing that this house is also belonged to them. <laughs> <laughs> Taliban. This lady, she called me. She's like, hey, are you teacher Aziz? I'm like, yeah. I was really famous by teaching all the uh, children in the neighborhood. So all the male and female, everyone old and young, everyone knew my name and they understand from my voice. Uh, so uh, she told me to go to the bathroom and she locked me in the bathroom. She's like, don't worry. My husband is also Taliban. <laughs> when he comes tonight, oh, I will talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, God, I didn't want this. <laughs> yeah. wow. But then she said that her son, uh, her oldest son was my uh, student. And because of that, she held, helped me. She gave me refuge in her bathroom for a few hours. Then she let me out. And, you know, that night I had to say goodbye to my family because my father told me, like, at the end of the, uh, the street that we lived there was this guy, a uh, human trafficking guy. He was taking, like... 39 people with him to United Arab Emirates, Dubai, they call him there. And uh, they're like, you know, if you want to join them, you know, grab some money and get all your uh, clothes and stuff and leave because it's not possible for me over there. And uh, <clears throat> I had to uh, leave my country because of Taliban at that time. And we ended up going to Pakistan, Iran, uh, spent a few nights through the Gulf waters. We made it to Oman and then Dubai. Wow. And I ended up working for a Christian family as a house buy. And then I was doing like hand selling stuff, buying from Chinese as a wholesale. And then sell them like in retails. The like glasses and Glasses, watches. <laughs> ro duplicate Rolex watches, yeah. binoculars. The, the, the Folex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And as soon as um, I noticed the uh, United States military presence in Afghanistan, so uh, my dad called me and he's like, hey, man, you need to come. This is your time. Wow. So I came to Afghanistan. I started my first job with uh, third special forces, uh, the Fort Bragg guys uh, at Kabul Military Training Center. After working a year, they saw something in me and shifted me to the <coughs> U.S. Embassy. And the uh, anti-terrorism assistance, they were training bodyguards for the Afghan presidential uh, protective service. And after working another year, then they moved me to <laughs> Chad. <Yeah. laughs> and, uh, that's, that's when yeah. all the... Uh, he, he graduated. The Tom Fuller started. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what year were you born? Uh, 1983. 83. Um, so from, from your recollection growing up, I know you said there was regime change, a lot of bloodshed, conflict, uh, civil war, et cetera. <clears throat> Culturally, was it very different, um, when, like from when you first remember until the Taliban took over, uh, was there a big shift that like, at least here, you kind of hear about that. You see pictures of like in the seventies and eighties where it was very Westernized and people were walking around, you know, dressed the way we're dressed. And then, it, you know, when the Taliban kind of really took over, then it, it went to super strict traditional. Do you remember that kind of, that shift? 
I remember when I was very, very young, like very young child, uh, the, during the communist regime, um, that uh, the girls didn't wear pants. They wear like mini skirts, the oh. school girls. They didn't wear head scarves. They were pretty much, as you mentioned, you know, like uh, more European, Western at that time. And because the society was ready for it. I mean, I remember that people came from Germany, from India to Afghan University, to Kabul University. They were doing their uh, degrees on the literature of Pashto or Persian or um, any other uh, local languages over there. And uh, things were really normal. Everything was really nice and neat. And the government governments were more um, accountable. Although it was communist, but it was still accountable. But then by the Mujahideen's takeover, everything was, um, you know, damaged. The whole institutions, the civilization was gone. All those people that were educated, they had a vision for Afghanistan. They saw that they could not live over there. Like, there was a hatred by the Mujahideen when they won the war against uh, Russians and communism. They did the same thing like the Taliban. Like, I remember they killed a lot of young people just because they were shaving their beard. They're like, you know, this is the son of uh, Prophet Muhammad. You're not supposed to shave this. If you shave this, you're not one of us. You're, uh, you know, one of the infidels. They did bad things, but then later on, they got civilized because of the aid from international community. And especially the last two decades in Afghanistan, they all became to wear ties and pants and be more modern. Their daughters are studying in very... Uh, uh, important or uh, very higher education institutions in United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Islamabad and India and London, America and many different places, uh, places even European countries. But then, you know, the Taliban take over, uh, they're coming over there, you know, again, we had to start from zero. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, everything which was like in 70, 80 percent came down to zero percent. So because they had their own ways and methods of uh, implementing the government or, you know, the policies or procedures for people. And I think one of the uh, important thing was that they, uh, by doing that, they were just controlling the people's minds because they saw that if they leave the people open like that, they will not be able to continue their barbaric regime in the country. Do you recall about how old you are, you were when they took over? Uh, I, I can't remember, but... <laughs> Um, I was very young. I didn't have beer, no yeah. <laughs> mustache. You know, yeah. I was very, very young. Wow. I remember that when they hanged uh, President Najibullah, when the Taliban last time they took over, they hung him like for two, three days. First, they dragged him behind the car. They took him from the UN office. And then they dragged him behind the car. Then they wanted him to sign the uh, Duran Line. Duran Line is actually its uh, border between Afghanistan and Pakistan that's separating the Pashtun population. Half stays on the Pakistan side, the other half stays on the Afghan side. And that this is the, the, the main uh, problem of Afghanistan since decades that all these uh, people that they marry like three, four wives at the same time with very very bad economical situations, you know, they're having sex and producing children, and all these children, they run away from them. They end up uh, becoming human traffickers, smugglers, or they just uh, go and work for radical terrorism groups like Taliban or, uh, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda or other, Lashkar uh, Taiba or other terrorism uh, radical groups that are staged in inside Pakistan and the, within the borders, the tribal areas where even the governments cannot control them. Yeah. So that's, that's where the main uh, difficulties and uh, regime collapses and the problems yeah. originates from. Yeah. Uh, I would like to take a real quick break and talk to you about uh, my bookie. I want you to uh, go to my bookie dot com and use my promo code mic drop uh, which you'll instantly get a deposit bonus up to one thousand dollars remember to use my code mic drop and bet with me only at my bookie primarily the only way watching these fights could get any better is to get paid doing it and my bookie makes that a possibility bet anything anytime anywhere with my bookie so when the taliban took over i know it was when you were really young but um i'm curious about the um 
the way that the different groups work there, because there are a lot of different terror groups, and, and I'm curious if, if you could make an analogy to um, kind of what that is like. Uh, you know, how, how many, say, like the, the top 10 different groups, is it kind of like gangs here or organized crime, like mafia groups, or, you know, what, what, what groups are there? What are their motiv- motivations? Where are they? Can you kind of give us um, some, some context to, to the layout of the country and the different groups, where they're at, and, and how powerful they are, what their, their goals are, et cetera? Uh, honestly, there is actually many different um, groups, uh, radical terrorism groups involved in Afghanistan. Like one of them is, uh, the main one is the Haqqani Network. The Haqqani Network is nurtured and trained by the Lashkar Taiba from Pakistani ISI that sometimes they use it against, against India, sometimes they use it against uh, Afghanistan, and sometimes they even use it against any country, like one time they used it against, uh, against Iran, uh, that uh, <coughs> they named them the, by their religion, and uh, you know they have really strict ideologies. Uh, anyone who wears like pants or shaves their beards or not having a turban, they think that they're all infidels. And then on the other hand, uh, you have the Kandahari Taliban, like who are all under the influence of uh, Mullah Muhammad Umar's son, the first uh, Amir of the Taliban that w- who was uh, selected by the Pakistan ISI when they first emerged at that time. Now his son, Mullah Yaqub, is uh, the, their leader. He is also the Minister of uh, Defense of uh, the Afghanistan right now under the Taliban regime. And uh, he's been traveling to Dubai, to Qatar, uh, Doha, and back in Afghanistan. And then there is uh, some other groups, small groups that are also coming from the um, uh, Haqqaniya madrasas of Pakistan, that they are the bosses of all the Taliban. Because all these Taliban, even like Mullah Hassan Akhun, who is the acting president of Afghanistan right now for the Taliban, even he is graduated from those madrasas. And yet he has not received his uh, educational diploma. I remember one time that this, I, I forgot his name, from the Hakania Madrasa, Lashkar Taiba uh, groups, there is this big old dude who, tra- uh, Mullah, who traveled to Afghanistan to make uh, kind of reconciliations uh, between the Haqqani network and the Kandahari Pashtun Taliban because there was a fight going on between them over the sharing the power. He came and he did reconciliations among them. And I remember that Mullah Hassan Akhun's translator, he was asking this uh, Mullah for the diploma of <laughs> this guy that he's graduated. But then he's like, oh, he graduated there. But uh, then he was under, uh, he didn't have an Afghan ID card. He only had like a um, Pakistani refugee <laughs> card that was issued by UN or something which was uh, ridiculous for me at that time. You know, selling the prestige and reputation of a country like that is, uh, you know, it's it's really heartbreaking. So as as far as some of the other groups, like at this point, uh, does Al-Qaeda have a legitimate presence there still? Uh, uh, According to the news and informations and, you know, the the, the friends that are still in Afghanistan, they, they are still yeah. there. The Al-Qaeda has a military presence in Afghanistan, actively in Pakistan and Afghanistan since long ago, and Pakistani military has been giving them uh, refugee. And uh, one of the main uh, witness or the vouch is that when their leader was killed uh, uh, or captured and then killed near the ISI HQ, like for all those many years that we were looking for him using yeah. the jingas with, you know, he was just hiding over there. <laughs> and uh, all these other radical groups, Tajik radical groups that they call themselves the ISK, they are also uh, from a different angle under ISI, uh, military of Pakistan. Uh, working in Afghanistan, making the waters dirty here and there, make explosions in the um, uh, Hazara mosques. The Hazara is a minority group uh, in Afghanistan. On the other hand, Iran has their own, uh, you know, interference in Afghanistan. I mean, there is the country has been changed to the <laughs> yeah. uh, like a 
war playground for the yeah. <laughs> for the you know region intelligence. Yeah. Well, so all right. So you've got the Taliban, which uh, is kind of the centralized, if you want to call it that, government that's technically in charge. But you've got Haqqani networks, you've got ISIS, ISIS-K, you've got Al-Qaeda, you've got uh, the Iran uh, influence and other offshoots. Do they all essentially recognize the Taliban as running the show, or are they kind of, is there a power struggle between all of them to try to take control of the country? Uh, there is. There is definitely a power struggle uh, between all of them. Uh, there is... Uh, We've seen uh, that happening right even in the EVACs when we started EVACs. Yeah. yeah. They were like... Like some like like uh, Mazar Sharif, the Taliban there were allowing us to to fly people in and out of there yeah. as coordinated them, but not in not in Kabul. So it's it's interesting. I mean, it's it's um, it, it seems like while we were there, that was the one uni, unifying factor for all of these groups. Is that the common enemy was the United States, and so right. they they kind of banded. But as soon as we leave, there's a, a vacuum, and now they're all fighting each other, and it's an even bigger mess. Yes. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, one one question before we get into kind of the um, sequence of events that uh, you know, in terms of the evacuation, that I'd love for you guys to kind of detail in depth. When you were growing up, what what was the um, the optics or or your opinion of the United States um, as a whole uh, b- before we ever showed up? I mean, it, was it something that that you gave much thought to? I mean, was was the United States a, a prominent from a cultural standpoint, was it even something that people really thought about, or, or how did that look? Uh, honestly, not uh, much people knew about the United States. So it wasn't like they hated the U.S.? And no, 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 there <laughs> was not uh, something like that, because first of all, there was not much media out there. There was only one TV that started at like 6 p.m. Uh, up to 9 p.m., and it only ran the programs that the government, the communist yeah. government, wanted them to, to, to broadcast and tell people. Other than that, they were all isolating and blocking all the news about Europe, about the U.S., and uh, all they were talking about Russians and um, all uh, the countries that were under the Russians, like uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and some other, including Afghanistan, they were all under the uh, the USSR at that time. And uh, there was not much talks going on about the United States. But when the United States physically um, came to Afghanistan uh, uh, militarily and started helping the people. The you know first thing, good thing that they did, they brought imported electricity from Uzbekistan to Afghanistan. They um, made all the roads, the highways, and people really, really started uh, learning about the United States culture, the people, and they really start liking them. Yeah. And that's why um, people from all over uh, 34 provinces of Afghanistan came together and worked under the United States military and they built their own um, army. Like there was no army in Afghanistan at that time. All the um, uh, local institutions were built by the United States, um, different projects funded by USAID and some other projects. I mean, they did such a great things that people will never and ever forget in their life. But there are uh, some radical groups like, you know, in every hundred, maybe ten or seven <laughs> guys, always you have uh, yeah. people that they are against you. It well, yeah. doesn't matter how much you do for them, how much you give them, but at the end of the day, still, they don't like you. Yeah. It's like the guy that wins the lottery and bitches about the taxes, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Actually, but before we get into the evacuation, since you're both sitting here, I know uh, you know you had some pretty awesome stories uh, when it was just you. But since you're both here, if you could share just a few of all the years that you guys worked together, if there are a, a, a couple of operations uh, that kind of stand out as being super memorable that were either close calls or super dangerous or uh, went ex- exceptionally well or, or what have you, if, if you guys can kind of run through your, your mental Rolodex of your experiences together and share some of those cool stories, that'd be great. Yeah. You go first. I don't know. Yeah, you go first. I don't know what should I say. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. You, you can say the, whatever the fuck you want. The, the, the QRF. Like yeah. The, 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 four guy, the, four, yeah. the four team guys. Okay, is it okay to say that here? Yeah, you can say that one. Yeah. You can okay. say anything. I don't care what you say. I mean, no, I care. <laughs> yeah, you can say I, that one. I don't want to get in trouble later. <laughs> You know, it was one of the nights that um, I was uh, in my house with my parents and uh, Chad and uh, a few other guys. They went on a mission, on a secret mission, 
without letting me know. They thought <laughs> that they would do it without me. And, uh, you know, they are in the bad guys' areas using this uh, commercial truck and having small guns on them. And in the middle of the night, this truck breaks down. And, uh, you know, they have nobody else. They, they don't have air support. They don't have infantry support. Nothing is there. They're in the middle of the bad guys where the bad guys town, like uh, between Kandahar and Kabul, the Palat province. And, a, a, QR, uh, a QRF would have, like, compromised operation. Yeah. And uh, if we rolled anybody, you know, overtly in there, it would have been a it was it was a bit of mess because it was yeah. it was how many Taliban of there were you? four of you? four uh, how, how well there was two of us and four okay. uh, of uh four team guys okay and uh Fucking team guys yeah <laughs> it's always the team guys. <laughs> and uh it, and if if it if would have been an overt effort to extract them it was like heavily like taliban village it would have wow. yeah. it would have been it would have been ugly yeah people would have died uh and so did they call you or? Yeah, yeah. they called me and uh, I had to uh, use my father and my brother and my cousin taking uh, other trucks and jingas, mm -hmm. come to this area. And first I saved the guys uh, and um, led the truck and everything else to my brother and my cousin. And then it took him the whole night to <laughs> pull him all the way to Kabul. But, wow. uh, you know, I had to use many different routes, you know, uh, take, accept a lot of risks. You know, just put them in a car where all the windows are tinted. Nobody can see him. No talking. You know, no sharing information yeah. or anything. Wow. Just well, what's funny is all the all the tech. You know, the technology and and uh, all the assets we have there. The link up was a uh, behind the bush. Ka -ka, ka -ka, <laughs> like hey, over here. Fucking three three amigos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, over here. Look over here. <laughs> God, that's yeah. Awesome. yeah, and that then was great. Uh, it was a. Uh, he he didn't he didn't know this at the time, but there was a. Uh, Really high level guy in J Bad and uh, just outside J Bad and Batacoot, uh, you're familiar with the Batacoot area. And um, and so we were actually going to, I, I was going to get to jump in with the command and, uh, and he was going to get to go to you. Oh, he would have wow. strapped tandem. And uh, but they ended up needing us to go in early. So we, myself, him, and, and another team guy, there was, there was, so we had another guy with us this time, went and spent two weeks there ahead, setting everything up. And uh, it was pretty cool because we were like living in this warehouse, like a you know, one light bulb on a cord, like yeah. freezing cold. You know, yeah. uh, we, we were like waiting. To, we had been there for like two weeks to set everything up, and then the guys actually jumped in. I think they just wanted to jump. To be honest with you, yeah. Yeah, I think they could have drove in. <laughs> and then they <laughs> they come patrol. They come patrolling in, and and uh, you know they got their quad, you know, quad MVGs on, and they're like all you know super like. Jedi out, yeah, Jedi out, and we we're like, hey, what's up, guys? Like, we, yeah. we're just like, we're yeah. just like, uh, you know, and yeah, that's and uh, we end up we end up getting them on target, and they, uh, you know, they got the got the bad guy. Yeah, what uh, can you say who the high level guy was, or was that a redacted? I, I actually, I actually don't remember. Yeah, uh, I don't remember. I, I just know he was like, he was like top, he was in the top ten. Yeah, wow. at the time, but I don't, I don't remember who yeah. else to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, is there a ballpark number of uh, operations that the two of you guys conducted together? Could you could you put a figure on that I, I, one time i tried I, I think probably probably 100 yeah or so like 100 or so yeah. that we were we were part of were, were there anywhere you ended up mixing it up shooting at people and uh you're laughing <laughs> you're shaking your head yeah. i splash water a lot on <laughs> yeah so you had squirt guns yeah. what are you talking about no yeah i we we with me never gotten uh any kind of like you know force on force like kinetic kinetic yeah. gunfire yeah. Uh, thank you know. Thankfully, uh, yeah. that would have been very bad for us. Yeah. Uh, we were you know, yeah. We we were there when you know with when, when our our squadron was there, like right there, and they you know, lighten people up and yeah. But uh, we're in the back of the stack. I got staying you. away. Yeah. Um, was, you know, was, if, I, if I ever need to get engaged in that, then something really went wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess to me, it's kind of like um, you know, I think a lot of. Um, the general public thinks that, you know, all special operations guys are like, you know, black belts and everything. And, you know, yeah. it's like if, if you get to the point where you're going hands on with somebody like yeah. things have gone so horribly wrong that being what at whatever level is fucking useless at that point. I suppose it's kind of the same with you. If you're having to zipper people up, then you guys are up shit creek anyway. Yeah. Was there at least a kind of a a contingency plan for that like were you carrying at least and did you do some training with him to oh yeah yeah so so yeah. like like you said like you know i think when most people think special operations everybody's kicking indoors shooting bad guys in the face when you go to the side that i went on you, 
that's what you're trying not to do. Yeah. Like I'm trying not if to do that. If it comes to that, you yeah. failed. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, it's being smart, using good at, you know, all your, uh, trade craft yeah. to make sure that never happens. And, uh, in depending on, you know, people like Aziz, uh, to take care of you and make yeah. sure you, you stay out of trouble. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we trained, I mean, for me, like, you know, going to the command that I was at, they made sure we had like a real high level of training. Uh, I would go to pre-deployment, uh, with a contract unit out in uh, Vegas every time I'd leave and they would, they would run me to uh call the loan operators course and do tons of like scenario training, uh, and every kind of, you know, foreign weapon that I would have. And I would carry, I would carry AKS, AK 47s, uh, you know, shooting PKMs and Fucking all John the local Wick stuff. Academy. <laughs> yeah. Just doing everything. And, yeah. and it really just, uh, all the scenarios you might run into at checkpoints from checkpoints to getting abducted to, yeah. you know, escaping, escaping and all that stuff. So it's really good. And a lot of good medical stuff. Uh, for these guys, we, we would take all of our guys out. Some of them would go out of country and get trained by the OGA. Uh, he, he never did. We trained him in house there, yeah. but we would train them in all the weapon systems and all the contingencies we'd run into. Yeah. And, uh, and, but when we, we would, so in Afghanistan, we would, we'd be armed all the time. Cause it's not uncommon if you get pulled over and people are gonna be like, why do you have a gun? Yeah. Cause I'm in Afghanistan. Yeah. But when we cross border into Pakistan, we were never armed. Kind of like Texas. Why do you have a gun? Yeah. I'm in fucking Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You cr yeah. cross over into, into California or Pakistan, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, it, you know, it, yeah. if I would have got caught with a gun in Pakistan, you know, people thought I was nuts for going around without a gun in Pakistan. But if I would have went across the border into Pakistan with a gun, I would have, and I would have had to explain why I had it. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were, uh, I remember we, we drove, we drove from, we went, we took a taxi from Kabul to, to Peshawar. So we went across all through Khyber Pass, across the Tarkham border. And we had, we had the Tarkham border, Tarkham border and going through. And I'm like leaning against the window of the car. And I had like a, I had like a, a, a scarf over me to pretend I was sleeping because of the checkpoint. And he's there. And the policeman jumps in the car with us to hitch a ride with us. Oh, so he's shit. sitting right next to me. Oh. Like, <laughs> and take, he rides all the way with us to like Peshawar. I'm pretending I'm sleeping, but like, you know, you don't want to have a gun in those scenarios. Yeah. Oh, one more, one more story that you'll, you'll probably think is pretty funny. We were, uh, we were in, you familiar with Peshawar is? Yeah. For, for, so for the listeners, like Peshawar is like, especially at this time is like the most dangerous place on the planet. In my opinion, I mean, that this is where the Taliban goes back on R and R. I mean, that's why they shut down, shut down the consulate, U S consulate there. Cause it was so bad. Uh, so we were at Peshawar and we were like, me, me and Aziz are eating at this like outdoor, like Dairy Queen is like co these concrete benches. And we would go there cause they had like real good Palau with quails, uh, quail. And we were like, they're just eating. And while we're eating this, some military guys pull up Pakistan military. And, uh, and then the Taliban pulls up like five Hiluxes with like mounted PKMs on top, black flags, tactical vest on. They're all dusty. They're just coming back from fighting like our guys yeah. and they pull up next to us and they're getting like their, uh, they're getting all their food and they're sitting down like at the table, like from me to you Holy fuck. and, uh, and me and Aziz are just talking and one of them sits on the lap of the other one. He has AK 47 on his hand. He crosses his legs like a chick and, uh, his AK is over here and he has a Pepsi bottle with a straw in it. <coughs> it drinking this Pepsi and his, his fingers are interlaced with the other guy. Uh, like it's the gayest <laughs> thing uh, I ever seen. Yeah. And, and I'm like, Aziz, yeah. I have to take a picture. And he's and he's no like way. he's like don't do it. He's like don't do it, brother. Yeah. Don't do it. I'm like I got to. He's like don't do it, brother. Oh, I didn't. Man. I didn't take it. Yeah, it I went. <laughs> it was really risky and dangerous at that time. Ca carrying a GPS, carrying or having uh, one of the smartphones or camera or taking picture, they would directly accuse you of spying yeah. for our Americans. What the and especially him, <laughs> he yeah. doesn't know any other language, and I'm afraid, yeah. like, man, don't talk, please, here. Yeah, just shut and up. Sometimes I would ask him to act as a mute, yeah. and then he's like, man, I cannot <laughs> do it. I'm like, no, you have to do it, bro. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's life the and death. Time, yeah. yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, I was curious, like the, you said, the Taliban goes there for R&R. &R. What, what does that consist of for them? Like, what do they do on their off time other than sit on each other's laps and, su <laughs> and suck down Pepsi well, with a straw? First of all, the, this area, Peshawar, Hayatabad, Shamshatu, this is the area that's given to them temporarily by the Pakistani government for all these tribal Pashtuns and the Talibans that they have their families there. doesn't matter how many regime changes comes back and forth they are there they are using them one time they used them uh, by the name of mujahideens now they are using them by the name of talibans isk lashkar taiba i mean there is many different other names that they have for them but they are using them 
um, from this uh, specific uh, boundaries or the geographical area. The, the fa- families are living, they have uh, specific designated courses, like from class one, from grade one, the, in the book for the child, it's written, my uncle is owning a gun. By his gun, he is killing the infidels. My uncle is a mujahideen. You know, these kind of things are taught for their children. So guess what? A child who is seven now, <laughs> after a few years, he will be another bad guy. Over there. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, like, an example, while we're sitting there eating, they're hanging out with the Pakistan military, really? who's supposed to be our allies. Like, and, wow. You know, I, I know that's not popular with our yeah. government to say that, but I'm... That's the we, fact, we right? see it, yeah. We yeah. see it every, everywhere we go. I mean, is that something that you would report back and they're just like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And they don't give a fuck? Well, I think the guys the guys care, but as it makes its way up somewhere, <laughs> yeah. somewhere at some level, they're just like... I mean, to me, like, it's, it's an easy thing to gloss over, but, you know, when you think about all of, you know, our brothers in arms and especially you guys, uh, the amount of setting your nuts on the line that, that you've done for them to dismiss that, I think is it borders on fucking traitorous uh, yeah, in, in I mean, my opinion. Yeah. I mean, these guys are coming back and you know, what, his PKM's broken. Hey, the Pakistan military is fixed. It's going to drive back across. Yeah, I mean, I, I, guys, you know? I, I would, I would love to know uh, and expose where in the chain of command that gets dismissed, yeah. you know, because to me like that motherfucker should be sitting on this couch and answering for that. Like, I, I want to know why you don't think that's a big enough fucking deal to do something about it in, in multi administrations. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's it, not, like, it's not uh, partisan. It's, I mean, it's yeah. through, through four presidents. Well, I've seen that same, that yeah. Pakistan being covered up for, do you have any idea where in the chain that they stopped giving a fuck? I don't, I could tell you, at the, I could tell you at the, uh, like ground commanders level, like, you know, unit commanders level, yeah. they're like, you know, yeah. wanting to go after those guys. But, but, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, for me, it, it's easy for me to sit here as a civilian uh, out of the military to say there, there should be something done about that. But I still stand by that. I mean, if yeah. I'm, you know, a fucking colonel on the ground there and, and my boss is telling me to not fucking worry about it, like, I'd be like, dude, I'll punch you in the fucking throat. Yeah. I, I am worried about it. Like, this is bullshit. Yeah. You know, like why, why are they not doing something about it? They're that? collaborating with the enemy. They're training the enemy. And then ultimately what we've seen during the evacs is all those 75,000 Taliban that came yeah. to, to swarm in around Kabul came from there. I mean, I know they were sitting in these, I've been in there, these rooms before and you probably have too. like rooms like this with flat screens everywhere. And you're watching that border and seeing people pour across that border as the United States is pulling out. And yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're all, you know, ISI, the Pakistan military, they they house train support yeah. and uh you know like like our support and advisory role Pakistan ISI and, and military is support and advisory roles for for the the Taliban. I mean, Period. is there a way to do something about that? I mean, yeah, have have a have a president of the United States is willing to. I mean, I think that's the commander in chief. That's a God. That's fucking <laughs> infuriating. I mean, I mean, because yeah. we're, we're in the middle middle of all that, we're sending the money. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we're 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 yeah. giving them money and and they're they're using that money to train the Taliban. Well, and and even getting involved on super high level geopolitical decisions as it relates to to the nuclear race with India. Like yeah. I mean, you know, we're getting in, involved in that and then they're they're pulling that shit. That's fucking bullshit. All of our equipment and we I know we're going to get into it. All that equipment that came out of out, yeah. of, out of Bagram, a lot of that went across that a lot of that yeah. our equipment went back across the border to Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. it's fucked up. Um you mentioned the phone thing. I am curious. How are, to your knowledge, the uh, the ISIS guys, the Taliban, the people that are uh, executing all of those operations, how are they primarily communicating? Is it cell phone? Yes. Are they using iPhones or, or are they using like they're using cheaper re- flip phones? Regular phones, regular cheaper phones, especially Chinese phones like Samsung Galaxy. Yeah. Or uh, real me, these kind of phones they use yeah. a lot. And right? we, we pull some VHF off of them too. Yeah. Uh, like, like uh, you know, after raid or something like that, they have VHF, VHF on them. Yeah. Is the uh, uh, site stuff. Is, is the prospect on our end in, in terms of jamming or destroying cell towers, is that a tactic or, or are you piggybacking off of them to, to listen in or is that is that a big thing or can you not talk about that or? I don't think I have enough knowledge to get myself in trouble talking about it. Um, yeah. You know, we'd put, we, would, we would launch listening platforms out there by. You know, we we launched them out there for NSA and and uh, and for the other components of the government we worked for. NSA and they, just entered the chat in this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I started dipping when I was in high school. Um, 
I started with pouches, as most kids do. Uh, ultimately, in the military, uh, I dipped the entire time I was there. A lot of us did. Um, you know, one of the things about dipping is that it, it kind of turns into a, a ritual where, it, you know, it's really part of uh, part of the culture almost uh, oftentimes in the military and in a lot of fields that uh, that are, are that way. And, and uh, one of the things, obviously, you know, real real tobacco uh, isn't the best for you. Um, but because of that ritual being such a, an ingrained part of that culture, it's something that a lot of times we miss. And even when I got out of the Navy, uh, I still dipped for a number of years. Uh, I wish that I had had this product, Black Buffalo. It's a, a tobacco-free alternative uh, that I can tell you it looks, smells, tastes, uh, feels everything like the real thing, uh, but there is no tobacco in it. And uh, it's a phenomenal product. Uh, they have mint, wintergreen, blood orange, uh, straight peach. Um, what's cool is they also, they, they've got... Um, the, the straight as far as the, the cut, uh, they've got long cut, they've got pouches. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a one-stop shop for tobacco-free alternatives that way. Uh, but they also have a zero uh, version, which has absolutely no nicotine. So you can get it with nicotine if you want the nicotine, uh, or you can get it without nicotine if, if you don't. Uh, it's all food-grade ingredients, um, green, green cabbage essentially, uh, as well as pharmaceutical-grade nicotine if that's the, the option that you choose. Uh, but it's just a, an awesome company. It's veteran started, uh, and they're big supporters of the Mike Drop podcast. Uh, and it's a product that uh, that I stand behind and and uh, absolutely endorse. It, it, it's a great great crew of guys. What's really cool about uh, Black Buffalo is it it's uh, you know it's the look, the feel, the smell, the taste, the texture, everything the same as as regular dip. And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's the, the big thing missing from all, all and any other alternatives, little pouches of nicotine or, uh, any of the other stuff that doesn't use a, um, a product that, that really has that same, same feel. It, it doesn't feel like you're actually dipping it. So, uh, black Buffalo has done a, a masterful job at creating that same experience. Uh, the flavors are all on point. Uh, the long cut and the pouches are, are both just like the, the real thing. And again, the fact that you can, you can get it with nicotine if you want. Uh, or you can get it completely nicotine free if you want. So again, if you're 21 years or older uh, and you dip and you want uh, that tobacco free alternative, go to blackbuffalo.com and the code is Mike Drop for 20 percent off. But uh, yeah, they, they and you know, I, I said I don't know enough to get myself in trouble yeah. with it, but they or maybe just enough. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> they they would they would uh they had some incredible technology to know about just yeah. they both zoom in on conversations, know exactly the right yeah. conversation to zoom in on just by putting a listening platform yeah. out there. Wow. It's, it's, it's some of the stuff they do is incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm still pissed off about the, uh, the Pakistani involvement. That shit tra chaps my ass to, to no, no end. Um, yeah. that, uh, you said it's a, a loan, loan operators course that you went to. Yeah. Um, it, how, how much of that is dedicated to cultural awareness as it relates to blending in and, and how big of a role did you play in kind of coaching these guys and kind of almost, uh, jump master checking them before they go out to make sure that they're not hanging out like a set of dog's balls because I, you know it's <laughs> i mean if like if you took a, a rancher from wyoming and he went to manhattan everybody's gonna be like where the fuck are you yeah. from like they're they're gonna know he's not from there so yeah. it's it's even more problematic for to, to get a guy like chad and, and all of our team members to blend in so how, how did the, you the kind wrong of piece of headgear like you, yeah. you wear your hair you wear a pakul in one place you're cool you wear a pakul in another place yeah. you're getting Rolled up. I, can only, I mean, that had to have been a big part of your exactly, job. Exactly, right? yeah. It's, uh, my job was not only interpretation. As Chad mentioned, it was also cultural advising, you know, studying the uh, uh, geography in advance, uh, doing um, uh, like a survey and then knowing what the people eat, what they wear, how should we wear our clothes. Like I would buy them man jammies, these um, scarves and, you know, Afghan boots even sometimes. Yeah. Just kind of to, uh, you know, change the appearance to fit in the geographical area because uh, one of the things in Afghanistan is uh, that uh, really popular that every time when they see a foreigner, all the kids and children, they are following him. Yeah. They ask him for money or candy because all, yeah. most of the soldiers, they have given him candies yeah. and money. And they You're a fat him. American. You got to have <laughs> skills on you. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah. and um, so every time like we were changing the car like the car the license plate the registration the documents everything has to be exactly the same according to that province that we are going to do the business yeah. and uh, same thing with the outfit and in most of the places like uh, when I see that there is a threat confronting us uh, I would ask him and also all the other American colleagues please do not talk you're not you're all mute right now you're yeah. not talking yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter he's like hey how about if I have something important to say you just write it down slowly and give it to me yeah. but he learned a little bit of Dari he could easily <laughs> yeah. uh, tell me slowly uh, all the important things yeah uh, that I can know if I was somebody's <laughs> talking they, they were talking about killing me yeah, yeah. I knew that yeah. <laughs> well so I mean Bouncing all over there, I mean, do, do you, I mean, I'm a, I can only assume like you have to be pretty proficient in Arabic, Pashtun, Persian, Dari, you said. I mean, yes. like, do, are you familiar enough with all of those languages to communicate yeah. in them? Yes. That's got to be fucking tricky. How many yeah. languages do you speak? Five. Five, yeah. fuck. Because, I mean, I, you know, I think, at least for, for me, my misconception was that it was, it, or, or maybe it, it is accurate. Are you familiar with Spanish and Portuguese, how they're very similar, but they're different enough? Is, is it kind of like that? It is. It yeah. is kind of like that. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's different enough to where you really have to know it. Right. You, like you can't just know Spanish and be like, oh, yeah, I, I know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that simple. No, no, it's not that simple. Yeah. Like Pashto and uh, Farsi, when you look at the um, alphabet, it's the same thing. But when they speak it, it's totally a big difference. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, like... Uh, when you split something <laughs> upside down, like <laughs> up yeah. and down, it's it's yeah. that that far from each other. Like Pashto is derived from Hindu Persian, but then it's spoken like uh, when you speak it, uh, when somebody hears you from far distance, they will think that you are speaking in Russian. Yeah, I mean it's to that extent uh, different. The meaning yeah. is different. The word is different. Sentence yeah. is different. And. Culture is different everywhere you go. Yeah. So all those different <coughs> languages and experience and everything, they, they play a very uh, vital uh, and crucial role while doing that kind of business yeah. over there. Because without that, it's not possible. You will uh, be engaged with lots of uh, difficulties or totally look off the hook, you know. Yeah. And also during the translations, like sometimes with um, some of my American colleagues, like sometimes they would get emotional or they would get scared at that moment and they would use some, you know, words that does not match their culture. So I had to just kind of, you know, cut and a little bit, you know, <laughs> yeah. merge and kind of fabricate or polish the shit to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not make the opposite party unhappy. And like yeah. in most cases we were, we were dealing with guns grenades and all kinds of things you know like especially on the checkpoints like on the one hand we were that powerful and we were going to these missions to fight the bad guys and then on the other hand when we're coming back to the main cities then i had to use my tactics and experience and you know my <laughs> initiations to deal with the afghan government now this afghan government was another pain in the bat for us yeah. while we're coming from the four provinces uh, once the mission is achieved coming to the main cities like they are all controlled by the police mm -hmm. army like hey you're carrying again where's your permit who are you belong to and we cannot say we are belong to this group we're Americans. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, fuck with us. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, were you uh, tasked with interrogations often? Um, no, not with interrogations, but just um, when I was at the KMTC during the patrol and house searches, I was. Yeah. So like kind of uh, on the fly. On the fly, yeah. But uh, with this team, uh, I, uh, on purpose, I kept myself separated so I could do uh, more... Uh, uh, business facilitation for yeah. them because if yeah. I would uh, involve myself with those kind of things, then I would not be able to, you know, yeah. in advance prepare everything else for them. Yeah, yeah. But once they get, then I become yeah, uh, there are people for that. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the on the fly ones, were there times where families would look at you like you traitorous fuck? Like why are you working with these guys? And and how do you deal with them when it's dynamic that way? I, I mean, do you say look? <coughs> like uh, how do you kind of level uh, them? first of all the the motivation that i had inside me for my country like when i traveled to dubai the um, first time uh through the human trafficking guy and uh, you know i saw this country the infrastructure the modernization the people's life and i remember the old days of afghanistan 
this was giving me the energy not to even give a damn about what people think about me or say about me because whatever the United States uh, military, government, uh, private projects or government projects they were doing, Afghanistan was benefiting from it. Yeah. Freedom of speech was there. We had over 64 TVs that never in the history of Afghanistan something like that was there. And over a hundred and something radios were on. People could criticize, they could call, they could, you know, say things about the government and they could uh, hear their uh, uh, wish and everything. So uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, we had elections, although it was a little bit crap, but still yeah. <laughs> we were walking towards modernization. Yeah. And my relatives... Uh, and the weddings and funerals, I heard a little bit, like not directly, but my, they uh, kind of spoke it and my wife heard it. And then she told me like, oh, he's a you know, puppet, he's working, he's an infidel, he's working for Americans and he's uh, you know, becoming a, a facilitator of uh, you know, hurting the Afghans. I mean, some people, that they uh, had a different ideology, like radical ideologies. But I didn't care about yeah. them at all because I knew that God knew, knows better that what we are doing and how much it's benefiting the, the this this nation and yeah. these people. If it was a, an instance where it's, you know, you're on target, on the fly kind of thing, and, and they kind of start off with that attitude of like, dude, fuck you, I'm not, you know, whatever. How, how would you try to, you know, walk them off the ledge and get them to cooperate if, if they were coming at you like that from the get-go? Uh, like I will tell you one of my um, personal experience, there was a time uh, in uh, 2007 that um, our guys did an operation in Logar province and, you know, they kind of jumped from the helicopters into the people's houses and they got some bad guys that they were there. They were trying to uh, do some suicide attacks on the U.S. embassy, the Afghan presidential palace and the army and kill innocent people. So... Uh, when we captured them, I was seen in that operation. And uh, those guys' relatives were re living in the same street in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, that one afternoon uh, when I was coming from the job, most of the time I was carrying a long gun, short gun, body armors, and a Toyota Land Cruiser armored car. Um, that I came to visit my family, that as soon as I stopped the car, <coughs> they stormed at me, like over uh, 60 people. He has gathered from the mosque, from the different streets, and from the neighboring area, they uh, had rocks and sticks, and they tried to hit me with that. I immediately reached out, and I pulled my Glock, and I shot at them a little bit above <laughs> their head. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and my wife, she's watching from over the balcony. She washed the clothes and she's trying to put them on the string to let the sun hit it. And she saw all these pe crazy people and she saw me uh, shooting in the air. She immediately called the 119. <laughs> <laughs> <It's That's bad laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the uh, police, they knew me very well. Each area that I went over there, I introduced myself to the police, especially to the chief of police, so that I get more protection from them. They know what, who I was. And, uh, you know, they immediately, two rangers of the police came from one from one side, another from other side, and they pushed all the people and, uh, you know, secured my house. The whole night, the police guys had to stay over there, and then the next morning, I had to leave. I was not worried about myself, but I was definitely worried about my children and my wife, and I had to totally switch that from that district to another district. Like, with that was 12th district, I had to come to the 15th district and just uh, rent me another house. But uh, there have been some scenarios, and they knew it. They knew it that whatever they say or... Uh, uh, criticize me or complain or, you know, finger points at me, they knew that I didn't care because yeah. my ideology, my hope and my wish was something for the, for the nation from, from the childhood that I was doing it. Every yeah. day I was doing it and, you know, the, I took that as an opportunity to help the country and the people that, that have been suffering forever. Yeah. For well, me, it was a pride. But uh, the soon as the government collapsed, and even if the United States withdrew, the government continued. 
it would still be good. But you know, when the government collapsed, I was one man. I couldn't control it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but before we get into that, was there a biggest fuck up that Chad committed as far as cul uh, cultural buffoonery? Like where you're like, dude, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like where you had to un unfuck him? <laughs> no, except uh, that one time uh, when uh, he wanted to shoot, <laughs> kill that guy, the, the guy that we were buying the guns from him. Oh, yeah. And um, I don't see anyth <laughs> anything <laughs> others except if you remember. <laughs> yeah, well, they were like, if we, we kill those guys, we would have. Yeah. Oh, actually, I remember one time, like, uh, we are uh, in front of the um, National uh, Bank of Pakistan in Kabul. <laughs> we are there to pick money from there. Oh, yeah. And Chad's a sportsman. Every time when he goes, he's doing this and trying to take weapons from people. people <laughs> and, you know, these little skinny bodyguards of the mm -hmm. National Bank of Pakistan, they're standing over there. And, you know, Chad is all with vests pistol and you know magazines and everything he's trying to go inside the bank to get money but the skinny guy is uh, trying to stop him and he the skinny guy reached to get his uh, pistol and he did something <laughs> technically and dropped this guy down with his gun and everything and this other guy skinny guy who is in front of the gate he wants to shoot him and uh, thank God that I noticed that before him and I loaded the gun and pointed at him I told him if you reach <laughs> your finger to that trigger, you are done. I will yeah. blew your brain. <laughs> wow. We're kind of at a standoff because the guy that at first, he reached for my gun. So yeah. I, I, Did you I, arm like, arm or something? Well, I, I like trapped his hand on my on my hand grip and then yeah. pushed him back to his elbow and put him against the window, like kind of fell against the thing. And when I seen the AK come up towards me, <laughs> I pulled the guy back in front of me. Yeah. So I got that guy like in front of me. And uh, and then I had my gun out and I had I had my gun on that guy oh, yeah, and then Aziz has got this gun at the other guy. <laughs> We're like in the middle of this bank, like at a standoff, standoff. <laughs> yeah. just trying like, to go and make a deposit. Fucking Wyatt Earp and Tombstone <laughs> yeah. over there. No, we were trying to make a withdrawal. That's yeah. it. Oh, man, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, <laughs> Other than that, were there? I don't know if I asked you this when you were here last time. Did have did you ever use jujitsu overseas on anybody? Uh, that's my only jujitsu. That's it. Uh, huh? That's, that's, yeah. that's my jujitsu. Forty years of training. Yeah, and, that's my jujitsu yeah. story. Oh. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, not having to use it is a blessing, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, man, that's that's intense shit. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, the, before that bank opened, though, it was crazy because I go in the bank and I would have a, I'd have like a a backpack. And I'd be going to get like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, you know, normally here they're bringing it back, but there's like shoulder to shoulder people in this. And like it'd be this size room, yeah. shoulder to shoulder people. Everybody's on their cell phones. It's a piece of glass. They're sliding it through, and you're stuffing in your backpack. Yep. And uh, and so, at any somebody, if I was a bad guy, I would just sit in there all day and say, yeah. "Hey, the you know, dude in the, yeah, yeah, green shirt, blue jeans on, brown backpack. He's walking out now. Grab him." Yeah. Like just sit. That's yeah. so I'm like assuming that's. And so uh, Aziz and, and uh, one of the other guys would be just sitting in the car waiting <laughs> to like mow somebody down. And, yeah. uh, and so it's like, it was just every that's time hairy, I go and man. get that money out of the bank, it was like, man, just yeah. nail biting. Damn, that's hairy. Yeah, yeah. They, did, they, they did that to so many people, to so many Afghan businessmen and some NGOs, some uh, uh, European guys, uh, they did them. They stole like hundreds of thousands of dollars from Jesus. them. They were directly reporting it from inside the bank. Somebody mm -hmm. sitting inside the bank, you know, just observing and seeing who is withdrawing how how much money, and then some he will report it to somebody else. And they did those kinds of bad things. But the good thing was that we were always uh, ready. We had guns, and uh, we had our bodyguards with us also. And uh, I, th I think they were just hoping somebody would. They were yeah, like, yeah. I wish somebody <laughs> I wish would. would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why it never we, happened. Yeah, <laughs> we we had our readiness for everything, yeah. especially working with yeah. Chad. You know, he militarily, he is totally equipped. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> stay, on, stay on your toes around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, all right, so um, if if we can kind of walk through the, uh, say that a couple days, like basically when you when you first heard whether it was through the rumor mill or it was actually coming down that hey the the U.S. is withdrawing. Walk us through kind of how you guys work together to, to get you out. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah. When I first heard the news, I didn't take it serious because uh, I had the hope and I was really counting on the Afghan army. And that was trained by the United States Army. And, you know, I have seen their capacity, capacities in the past, all the guns and ammunitions and equipments that they were uh, given to. So I was thinking at least maybe another three or five years 
this this war will continue before the Taliban even uh, captures the whole regime or before even it becomes that dark for me not to be able to live in Afghanistan anymore. But uh, on the other hand, I was worried about my daughters. I was seeing it that they could not go to school because the Taliban stormed into different provinces. And, you know, the provinces uh, collapsed one after another province. And they were uh, capturing the provinces and they were killing, they were torturing all those people that worked for the Americans. And uh, they killed them to the very, very bad uh, stage of uh, the killing and torture stage. That I, I don't even have any words for that one to say it here. So uh, that's, that's when I knew it was bad. When when, exactly. when a Taliban killed those twenty five commandos, and there was no repercussions, I'm like, this is gonna fall quick. And as soon as the Taliban did that, and knew that there was no gonna be no no penalty for that. Uh, they knew that the Afghan National Army was on their own. I'm like, this is gonna go. This is gonna be like weeks, or months. Did you know those twenty five commandos? Did you guys know them? I, I didn't. No, I didn't know them personally, but I knew them where they worked, where uh, they operated from. What, what did they do? Did they just kill them or did they torture them? And no, first they tortured them. First they tortured <clears throat> them, they loot them, they got all their personal uh, expensive materials from them, like watches, cell phones, money, and everything, and then they killed them. Yeah. They, they did it publicly too. Publicly, yes, yeah. and also they sex enslaved their children, their daughters, and their wives. Holy fuck, man! Yeah, they have their own interpretation uh, according to their uh, Islamic religion. They have their own interpretations. Like if they um, kill, they say that if they kill a bad guy or a infidel guy who is not trusting in their Allah, so they are allowed to even marry or uh, sex enslave their. Um, females and get all their treasures and everything. Same like, uh, like in the, you know, centuries ago that people were doing these kinds of barbaric things. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk at that time, and and you know, I've heard a lot of people politically on both sides say this, and I think it's just, a, and unfortunately, our, our president said it, which was embarrassing uh, for me. But it said, uh, you know, that <clears throat> that how could you help continue to help these people when they weren't willing to fight for themselves? which is such a naive or just evil statement because in the last 20 years, 60,000 Afghans, 60,000 Afghan soldiers died protecting that country, which by, by, it's uh, more than Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. By ratio of like, you know, of a populace of, of Afghanistan. That's, that's huge. It's like our yeah. civil war, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then, um, and then uh, all the civilians that died, you know, wanting a free Afghanistan and, and then to train them for 20 years to prop them up, and, and have the whole international community, not just America, but the whole international community supporting, advising them with air support and then in, without notice negotiate with the enemy. The, the United States government didn't negotiate with the international community. They didn't negotiate with the Afghan government that we put in place. They didn't negotiate with the Afghan National Army. They negotiated with the enemy and, and withdrew without notice. All air, is, I mean... We pulled the rug out from under them, set them up for failure. And now these guys that are still wearing Afghan national you know, uh, uh, army uniform, they're not away on deployment like us. Their wives and kids are down the street. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, so imagine the situation they're in. Like, do I fight to the death and have my kids, my daughters be sexually? Or do I, you know, take care of my own right now? It, we really, they were, it, there's no greater setup for failure than what we did to them. Is there a, when you say they, uh, in terms of the United States, do you know who, who they consists of as far as who did the negotiations? I mean, obviously, uh, ultimately, it's the president's decision. It's the however. president's decision, and he was advised against it by, I think, most of the intelligence community and, uh, and, and the DOD, the Joint Chiefs, advised him against the withdrawal. Um, I know the international community was very upset. Uh, they, they, uh, the lack of... Uh, the, the silence said it all. Yeah. Uh, but um, so, I mean, I guess the the, mo the most uh, the highest up individual would be Joint Chiefs Millie, right? Millie. And then you have a uh, so you have Millie at, at the Joint Chiefs. But then you, ha you also have a um, um, State Department. The, 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 the oh, uh, yeah, Anthony Blinken. 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 Yeah, Blinken is Blinken was a, you know, a really big part of all this. Uh, the negotiations with the Taliban during the evacuation. So Blinken's office was doing a lot of the negotiations with the Taliban, which sounds crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, and then they had the Doha agreement, which was uh, the Doha agreement was saying that if the Taliban takes over, they would not allow terrorism in Afghanistan, which is kind of ironic because the Taliban are terrorists. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the Doha agreement was, was part of the, the negotiation. Yeah. 
There are lots of things that have not been uh, fulfilled practically according to the Doha agreement mm -hmm. between uh, Taliban and the withdrawal. Uh, like uh, one of the things was allowing the, the females to go to school, preparing the environment and situation for all the females to go to school. And there has to be like a um, uh, national uh, forgiveness for all the soldiers that they have worked for the ex-government their life and their females and their house, everything has to be secured. All those things are mentioned in that agreement, but none, none, of, none of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was a Hari being there, uh, Al Qaeda being there. I mean, yeah. uh, and yeah. the Taliban themselves. Yeah, you know? yeah like uh, right after a couple of weeks or a month or something, they killed uh, Emin Zawari in the heart of Kabul, right? Yeah. <laughs> Next door to the yeah. Hakanis and the. Yeah. And, then, you know, and then uh, the White House is high fiving, you know, yeah. how great a thing it is, but you know, why are you. Why is this yeah. guy comfortable with being? Yeah. Well, we created a hotbed for terrorism, to, you know, safe for yeah. terrorism. I mean, I, so I, I mean, I, I, they, they still need to be held accountable. You know, Blinken is, is a civilian. Uh, Biden, you know, certainly never served, but they're being advised by the intel community and the DOD. And again, like if, if you're going through the chain of command, unless I'm uh, misinformed i mean that millie would be the, the the top guy right that that he's trying to influence by and do you know if he tried to get it, him to do something different i i i am told uh that that millie did advise against the withdrawal and uh in if you look at what happened in the evacuation the neo operation non-combatant evacuation operation was taken away from the dod by the white house it's a deal it, it is a dod function to evacuate civilians in, uh, out of a war zone or combat zone yeah. uh, it was taken away from the dod and given to blinken at the state department which is a huge mistake because that's the reason you have military force and diplomatic negotiations yeah. to be separate uh and now then then the the uh state department treats the last refuge which is h kaya like an embassy and uh that's why our troops weren't allowed to go out and evacuate people they had to just protect that airport like an embassy which meant that the Taliban now had the outer perimeter and, and, uh, and anybody, anybody knows anything about ground combat knows whoever controls the outer perimeter controls access to and from the airport. So really the Taliban controlled the airport at that, at that time. Yeah. I, I guess for me, just from, you know, trying to hold, you know, the, the people that are in the positions to make these calls, whether it's the Pakistani influence or, or right. fucking up this, uh, this operation, like what, what drives me and I think, almost everybody that doesn't have any skin in the game with Raytheon and Halliburton contracts and, and greasing skids for the, their uh, transition out of the military and, and cush fucking jobs yeah. that way is people are, are fucking tired of, of nobody being held responsible, nobody taking accountability, nobody being, nobody saying, you know what? I fucked that up. Right. I, I you know, I fucked that up and, and it's my job to fix it at, at a minimum. Like I'm here to say, this is my fucking fault. Yeah. Like nobody does that. No. Nobody. And in this, in this scenario, I mean, it, well, Americans were left behind. Americans yeah. were killed. And I mean, and, 20 years of, of expecting people in the, in their country, such as you and, and all of the people, you know, like asking everything from them. I mean, everything like up to and including their lives, their families lives, you know, and then just saying, fuck it, we're out of here. Yeah. To me, somebody should have to answer for that, you know? Absolutely. And again, like, you know, if, if you're going down the fucking chain, Millie is, is the next guy. Now, admittedly, I'm a little biased. I don't fucking like the guy. Right. Um, but having said yeah. that, let's say he, he gave that recommendation. Biden's like, yeah, Roger that. Fuck it. I'm, I'm not listening to you. Yeah. Like to, to me, if you really stand behind that and, and if he had recommended that, why the fuck would you still be working for stand that guy? Down, the the first by. thing I would do is I'd, I'd set my shit on his desk you. and be like, I am not working for you anymore. And, and the fact that he still is says that to me, says everything you need to fucking know about yeah. the guy. I mean, yeah. plain and simple, like you can say I advised against this. Well, motherfucker, you're still working for the guy that completely fucked you over, fucked over all of your guys and left you holding the fucking bag the whole way. So that doesn't make any that doesn't jive with me yeah you know? there's been no accountability for anyone and, and you know i think even take a step further back than that is uh i think most americans have have bought into this idea that we should have left afghanistan that it was a 20-year war it was an endless war and maybe we left wrong but it was a, but it was the right thing to leave and, and that's just not true because when you really look at afghanistan one it, the, the the bagram air base is the most strategic place in the globe it's between iraq iran russia and china 
it is the most influential place in, in the current yeah. current uh, dynamics of the, of the of the world. In addition to that, uh, to say that we were we had to get out because of our troops uh, is just is just BS. We had twenty five hundred yeah. at one time, four thousand troops there. Yeah. We have eighty thousand in, in Japan still since World War II, and yeah. forty thousand in Korea and in Germany. But the, the international community, everybody was participating there. We were keeping the Taliban at bay. Yeah. We were supporting it by the Afghan National Army. It wasn't our call in my opinion to leave agreed uh and we, sh we shouldn't have never left i want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast which is bubs naturals uh the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to glenn doherty his nickname was bub uh, i did two platoons with him and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs uh, sean is the best friend tj is their colleague uh, started Bubs Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bubs or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, Collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing, uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product and number two is is so near and dear to uh you know to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for for who it uh, was started for and what it stands for um you know it's just uh, it's an amazing amazing place to be so um it is whole 30 approved um it's uh, sport certified so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that um and i will say that um you know right now they're they're offering uh 20 percent <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and uh, use the mic drop code. So uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day-to-day day -day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health, and, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bub's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. I agree. And, and uh, you know, for, for the, the sentiment of the population that thinks, you know, yeah, we, we handled it wrong, but we should have left. I couldn't agree more in, in your uh, perspective. And, and I'll take it a step further in saying if you look at world from World War II, or it's, we'll say 1945 to as we're sitting here, you know, Germany and Japan are really the, and, and maybe Korea, uh, maybe not. But Germany and Korea, or Germany and, and Japan, for sure, are the textbook examples of, of how you execute post-war um, into the future operations. You know, th those are the two places that, uh, of, of everywhere we've been, aren't a fucking train wreck. You know, and and, and if you look at why, that that's why. Yeah. And I think the the contingent of troops that we had there, the reason why it was going so well is not. Um, you know, be, because of what we were doing or not doing, it was the fact that we had just enough of a footprint there to say, if you fuck around, yep. you're going to find out, yep. you know, and, and the threat of, of having a strong president that's not going to put up with an ounce of, of shit, i.e. executing 25 commandos, is what's keeping any of those people from doing it. Because the second they knew that that wasn't the case, they swooped in. It's not like yep. they couldn't have done it before then. They chose not to because they knew what the fuck we would do if they had, you know. And, and so to me, it's just like it's it's such a a mind numbingly catastrophic failure on so many goddamn levels that that just I mean, it makes me sick. It makes most, I think, combat veterans fucking sick. Yeah. Um, anyway, got off on a little bit of a tangent. So once you realized 
this shit's going to go bad. Did you contact him first or did he contact you? And how, how did you end up getting him out of there? Yeah, so we, we, we started contacting probably in June or July saying, hey, we're going to come up with different ways to get him out. We're trying to get him out uh, through, we were working with Daily Caller. Uh, we we're actually going to go in and do a story, take the Daily Caller and do a story. Uh, I got the green, green lit from there. Uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name? McGinn, Richard McGinnis, the guy who did undercover with Antifa for <clears throat> Tucker Carlson. Yeah. So he was going to go and take us in. He was going to be our cultural advisor. We would go back and do the after interviews with his family in Dubai. He was never go back. D yeah. Did you call him first and say, hey, you got to get me the fuck out of here? Or did, did he contact you? We, we were in contact. We were <laughs> in contact since, since long, text messaging by, by the messenger. But, uh, you know, when the time came that when he realized that he's really coming to save me, when he called me. Yeah. yeah, I'm like I'm like we're yeah. we're, we're gonna get you. And most I, and of the time, we would just use the WhatsApp or Messenger yeah. texting. Yeah. And and what were you doing at that time, as far as uh, your your own kind of self proactive uh, actions, as far as to, you know, were you moving around? Were you moving your family? Like how how are you handling uh, handling it? I was uh, having my guns ready. In all the floors, and <laughs> the can, house. The can house. you talk about your family for a second? How, yeah. how many do you have? Uh, wife I and? have uh, six children. Good Lord. Three daughters, three sons. Yeah, and tribe. My, yeah. <laughs> and you guys all wife. live at your house now? <laughs> yeah. neck, uh, in the neighborhood. Yeah, wow, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, so you're, how old are they? Uh, 19, 18, 15, 14, 8, 7. Yeah, that is a fire team if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Uh, so, so you're trying to calm them down. Are, are they aware of kind of how, how dangerous things uh, have been? They were, they were a little bit aware, but they really didn't know what I did about my job and history and everything. But all they knew is that whoever worked for the Americans, their life is in danger. Their yeah. family's life is in danger. My daughters, uh, looked, uh, really terrified. And every minute they were asking like, Hey dad, uh, what's your plans? Well, how will you save us? Where are we going? Did you tell them yeah. to stay in their fucking lane and, <laughs> and, and you'll handle it? Yeah, they, they, yeah. probably, they probably thought he was a drug dealer. All yeah. the years. <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, if it was me, I'd be like, let, let me just let your dad worry about the dad shit. And yeah, you guys yeah. make sure the fucking whatever. But. Yeah. But as soon as they saw me that I pulled all my AKs and guns and I staged them in different floors, uh, by the gate, by, you know, if they come from this side, I would use this. If they come, like I made the, an operational area <laughs> from my house. Wow. <laughs> Ammunitions, pouches, you know, magazines and everything, grenades. And I'm like, if, if they try to come uh, after me and get me and, you know, I will kill them before they, yeah. they, they even reach to me. And I even t uh, told my wife, because she knows a little bit also how to use <laughs> the guns. Yeah. I trained her over there. That's awesome. And... Um, uh, no, same time, but then still from inside, there was a fear inside me, like I was losing my energy, you know, my body was becoming weaker and weaker, especially when every time when I look at this TV, the bad news is there that, oh, the Taliban has captured this, another province, and they killed this many Afghan soldiers, interpreters, this and that, or contractors, and sixth enslaved their daughters and females, and I, I was getting more frustrated and nervous, and Chad and Dad and all the other friends, they exactly knew what I was going through, they would send me um, scripts from the Bible, uh, you know, just reading it to pray over me and then sending me some uh, text messages of jokes, making jokes yeah. with me at that time <laughs> just to kind of, you know, keep me going until yeah. they physically come over there. Wow. And it, it was really, it, it really difficult times uh, uh, ever in my life. And uh, I saw uh, the Afghan soldiers <clears throat> that they were, sh uh, they got shot at. Uh, their heads, their faces, and their lungs, and, you know, just because they were resisting, not giving up uh, their guns and ammunitions and uh, the, the um, uh, transportation, the vehicles that they had with them, the Taliban wanted to take it from them, they, they resisted. So they lost their lives right in front of my house, and uh, especially uh, seeing that when my daughters, they saw that from the roof, then that was the time that they really became... Uh, disappointed and nervous and then uh, what I did was every time when Chad or Dan or other friends the, the, and the team with Chad that they would call me or text me 
I was putting the phone in the loudspeaker, so just kind of to give the feeling for my daughters yeah. and my wife that my brothers are coming. Yeah. They're not going to leave us alone, and everything is in the process. It just needs time. But, uh, you know, the five days was uh, worse than as hell. Yeah. Moving from one place to another place, using my brother-in-law with his little taxi car, carrying guns with me inside his car, and, you know, wrapping my face and my children. <clears throat> and the guys from inside the Kabul airport, Chad's team, they would send me, like, Google Maps uh, locations or GPS locations to try this gate. Each gate that I go there, it's not possible. It's packed with thousands of thousands of people from different sectors. They are trying to get inside the airport. Uh, for some of them, they really needed it. For most of them, their life was really in danger. For a few of them, it was just like a, as a lottery opportunity to you know get inside the airport, get on the plane, and then end up in the United States. There was all kinds of people, and there was also the Taliban themselves. They were pushing <coughs> themselves to get inside the airport. They were looking for <coughs> interpreters, contractors, ex-military officers, or soldiers. And um, <coughs> overall, it was really risky, dangerous, every step that I took every step that I walked over there, but then the whole night or the whole day, uh, then we had to turn back with, with, with lots of disappointments and hopelessness, come back to another location, buy <clears throat> some food for the family, and uh, send messages to Chad and Dan and say, hey, brother, we couldn't make it. And so they're like, no worries. Tomorrow they will send you another location. Try that location. But... <clears throat> try to go first, leave the family, you go first, then come back. Because what happened was the airport, the internal uh, security was controlled by the U.S. Marines. Then the middle circle was controlled by these uh, Afghan soldiers uh, trained by the CIA. They call them the zero units. And then the outer uh, circle was controlled by the Taliban. That was really difficult. So <clears throat> one time I even made it like from the tall, I passed the Taliban circle, I made it to the zero units, then the zero units guy, they wouldn't let me because I was all dressed up in Afghan and my beard was growing long and I, uh, you know, <clears throat> I didn't have my documents with me because I was afraid if I have it with me, then if the Taliban finds out, they will shoot me at that spot, that second. They will not even give me a chance to speak. Wow. Um, it had to have been incredibly nerve-wracking and difficult for you to leave your family and, and go <clears throat> test that water like how, how was that weighing on you it was <clears throat> really um heartbreaking uh, nervousness frustration and but i had no other choice yeah. i was only um, <clears throat> telling myself that i have to do this because there is no other options we are in danger anyways. Whether I wanted it or not, we are in danger. Today, tomorrow, one month after, they will find me. So I had to accept all those risks, regardless of uh, knowing that you know it's dangerous. I had to accept and find that route, a safety route to uh, make it inside the airport. On the other hand, uh, the <clears throat> right before the regime collapsed, like a few days before that, my wife, she had this problem of uh, appendix, we call oh, it. Wow. And she did that operation. And unfortunately, <clears throat> because the doctors over there were not really good and the medicine is a cheap medicine that's imported from Pakistan and it was not really effective. So the wounds were all infected. And, you know, she's crying uh, with all these fresh wounds, <laughs> I would call it. And, you know, she's she couldn't walk. She's like, I would rather die inside my house <clears throat> but not, uh, you know, under the feet of the people because there are thousands of the people. I saw uh, girls and females that when they were shot at their head, they dropped down, the people were just stepping on them and nobody was really caring about that because it was like, as they say, the doomsday. Panic. Yeah. yeah, panic. Just everybody and, for themselves. Yeah, faint and everybody wanted to make uh, find a path for themselves and make it to the airport. But then uh, the very last, the fifth day, it was really disappointing and hopeless. My wife, she was resisting. She was not coming. And uh, so <clears throat> I had to convince her and persuade her. And I brought them and parked them away from the crowd 
So I wrapped myself in my uh, big Afghan scarf and uh, this guy uh, who told me his name was Sean, the little Sean. Yeah. And, you know, he sent me his picture. I sent him my picture, my whole family's picture. And <clears throat> he had to come outside with his teammates because Chad told them because there was no other option. I could make it from the passing the Taliban, but then the zero units was another obstacle. And so so you, you were alone or you were with your family? At I time? was at that time by myself. Okay. I had my family like a few kilometers away from the crowd sitting in my brother-in-law's car. At first we had sent him on the other side of the airport. He had yeah. missed that link up. And so we had a, a military unit on that was willing to work with us, a, a, a JSOC unit, and they came out the gate to grab him. What's going through your mind day after day where, where you know, it's hard to get in contact with him and he's missing the, the points? Like, Well, he was, we were having these conversations. You know, in the meantime, I'm trying to set up the whole, the 12-person team, the, get the resource together, get all the, the operational infrastructure together. So I'm doing that. We got our ground team out there. I'm community, it's just chaos uh, everywhere. And then, and then he's, uh, he's not wanting to go. And there was, there was a point to where he said, I can't do it anymore. And I'm like, oh. yeah, you can. Oh, like, fucker, get on yeah, the plane. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I've seen you do worse. Like, get yeah. out there <laughs> one more. I'm like, try one more time. Yeah. Like, one more time. Yeah. And, uh, wow. and that was the time you made it through. That was the time you made it through, yeah. So what, um, you made it to, uh, to the, through the Taliban and to the zero guys. Yeah, to the zero guys. And then they're shooting at me. They're pushing me. They're like, you, you are not supposed to be here. Go, go, go. The and I'm like. The Marines shot at you too. Yeah, the Marines. And then once I made the Marines shot at me, I'm like, hey, do you guys know Chad? He's a very famous guy. <laughs> Google him. I worked for him. He's like, no, we don't know all they're the like, young sure Marines. You yeah, yeah. Because I have all the scarves and things with me. They, they probably think I'm a suicide bomber or yeah. something. Man. So finally, uh, I noticed that Sean with his friend is on the other side of the street, like there's uh, 100 meters of space between us. So I, you know, called, and I called him. I'm like, hey, Sean, Sean, Sean. He didn't hear me. And then I kept repeating my own name. I'm like, Aziz, Aziz. And then Alex, who was standing by Sean, he's like, hey, that's your man. We're looking for him. He's like, come on, come on. And then the zero unit guys, they are shooting at me. He told them, no, you're not shooting at him. He's my man. Let him in. So when I was there, then uh, Sean and Alex, those guys, uh, asked the zero units, a few of them, with their guns to walk with me and allow the car from their first checkpoint to come uh, to the airport because my family was sitting in there. And then I'm like, oh, there's Taliban. They're like, don't worry about the Taliban. If they shoot, we will shoot. We are all soldiers. I'm like, okay, let's go. And, uh, so you, that, did you call your wife and say, okay? Yeah, I called my brother-in-law okay. because he was driving. I told him that, do you see this area? I give him kind of some guidance and instructions. He, But he was too afraid. He's like, yeah. no, they are shooting at me. I'm like, no, I'm coming towards he, you. He was yeah. on Facebook and hit ignore when you called. <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> yeah, probably. No, I'm into this cat video. Give me a minute. Yeah. 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 Man, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. So he so he answers and you say, bring it in. Yeah, I brought it. And then once my family was saved, then I <clears throat> received another phone call uh, from one of uh, Chad's uh, teammates uh, saying that you have to go back out. There is this girl who's there for the whole week. She is thirsty. She is hungry. They pushed her down from the wall. She's all wounded. You need to rescue her and bring her with your family like your daughter. She was one of the American University of Afghanistan uh, student. Mm. And, and Dan told me, so I had to put my life back in mm. risk, go outside and look for this girl. And it took me hours and hours in that crowd. And she is sending me uh, the GPS locations. And I'm coming right over here. It shows me that she's on top of this uh, stone but she's not there <laughs> whereas she's wounded she's all hurt you know she's kind of it's like, like a college girl a car college yeah. girl Is your yeah. wife looking at you all side-eyed like why are you having to rescue this college chick? <laughs> oh she didn't know she's like where are you going i'm yeah. i told her that i have to go and talk to my american friends and yeah. be back she didn't even know she was safe inside the airport waiting in the line there were other thousands of people that they were moving towards the building of cbp to get screened fingerprint eye print and all that uh, paperwork process waiting for the plane uh, I found this girl, and then, uh, you know, when I came back 
I was engaged with the same kinds of difficulties. Then I had to call Sean, and Sean had to send me wow. those Afghan soldiers <coughs> out, and we were escorted again. But uh, as soon as I was inside the airport, and you know, <laughs> because Hudaybia was very bad in Jordan, hurt, yeah. I'm holding her. And that's the, the moment that when my wife looked at my eyes, she was a little bit shocked. She's like, does he have another secret wife or something? Because yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. in Afghanistan, it's normal. You can yeah. have four wives at the same time. So why, why would you do that to yourself? She's, uh, she was probably yeah. shocked that she's yeah. saving the, he's saving the, her, his second wife. Huh? <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Uh, your brother brought you in. Did you bring your brother with you? Were you able to bring him? No, so I was he, not. We, we had to get separated because everyone knew us. My dad went on one route, my brothers went on another route, I had to go on another route, and that Are was... The brother-in-law, there was a brother-in-law in the that car. That was oh, my okay. brother-in-law, yeah. My is he still there? He is still there, oh. yeah, he's still there. Is it, uh, I mean, I, I guess, where, where, where does that, <coughs> is there a line that exists for the Taliban to say, okay, we're not going to kill this family member, but you know, like at, at some point, yeah, you know, like you can only evacuate so many people from a family. Like there, there's still going to be, yeah. The, the good thing was, people yeah, yeah. The good yeah. thing was he was not uh, working for me. Yeah. And, uh, his house was totally in another district. He didn't come very often to my house, but when I left, he tried to secure my house and guns and, you know, everything else in the house. And he tried to stay in the house. So the Taliban, Basir and those guys, when they captured the house, when they came to the house, they uh, tortured him. They beat him to death almost. Uh, they put him in, the, in his own car trunk. He has like a, a 1996 Toyota Corolla. They locked him up over there and they searched the house. They got all the guns and expensive uh, properties and belongings from the house and then they took him to the jail and they were asking about me but he told them that he doesn't know me he doesn't have any relation with me he's just a body uh, security guard and um, you know he sent me pictures it was really heartbreaking I saw his back was all turned uh, black because they hit him with the cables and yeah. they were asking for information they're like where are his computers where are the cameras this and that what uh it sounds like you left pretty much everything there. I mean, yeah. what what did you bring with you? Anything? A backpack. <laughs> yeah, like so. Each each person had a backpack. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, I have a small backpack. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Wow. One pair of clothes. We came when we ended up in uh, Abu Dhabi humanitarian city. Uh, I had we had nothing. Yeah, we had nothing. I asked um, Chad and Dan to buy me some clothes from outside because we yeah. couldn't leave the humanitarian city yeah. in Abu Dhabi. Because first of all, we were there was a fear of that they are all Afghans. They are not vaccinated. The coronavirus was really famous at that time. And, yeah. um, uh -huh. Plus, we didn't have a visa for that country, so the whole time we had to stay inside the humanitarian city. And how, how long were you there, and what were the conditions in that like? The conditions, uh, there are goods and bad conditions. First of all, the good condition is that the food was coming right behind the door. Um, the doctors were there that if somebody got sick, they would treat them for free, free food, free house, electricity, Wi-Fi, everything. But then the bad thing was that uh, there is all these 10, 12 NGOs involved uh, for the process of the immigrants, like uh, probably, probably I'm guessing FBI was probably there, CIA was there, all the other important agencies. I, I doubt it. I'm sure they. Did. <laughs> you they know, were. they were processing <laughs> people, but and uh, and the State Department was yeah, def definitely negligent and yeah. and, and doing yeah. the right thing and, and processing uh, them. Afghan embassy and all this. There were no clear instructions. All these thousands of immigrants are brought and they're put in these buildings. And then it, now it's belonged to the Arabs. So nobody can touch them. So the Arabs, they screen them, they process them, they get all their information and put them in the computer. And, you know, the medical team shows up like 3 o'clock at night. They're like, hey, Aziz, we don't know where to start, where to end. We are told to, you know, <clears throat> inject uh, this, uh, for example, Marcelilla vaccine for all these Afghans or the COVID vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine or other vaccines, but we don't know. Then I had to step out and take the lead for the whole 17,000 people and using my American connections because the Arabs would not even let me to come out. Like I would call Chad, uh, 
hey brother, tell the CIDs to open my door. I'm coming to visit you. So yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, he, he became like the president of humanitarian yeah. city. Like he's awesome. he he went in and he organized like okay in in this quad like the, you're in charge. In this floor you're in charge. This yeah. building you're in charge. The building the, each person in charge of the building you report to me. Yeah. He set up org. Uh, like right away he Damn went in shot caller. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. So, uh, so where, what was your uh, your path or journey during that five day period? Were you stateside the whole time? Did you did you go to Abu Dhabi or where? How how was your uh, involvement other than coordinating shit? Yeah. So so when when as we made the decision to go, we put together a team about twelve guys. That's where you know. Uh, Kennedy, if you've seen the documentary, send me C Spray, Dano, uh, Joe Roberts. We put together all these guys from all pretty much soft community guys. And uh, my, my son Hunter was in that group. Wow, yeah. Uh, which was, you know, pretty cool. At first, I was like, he's like, I want to get, I want dad, I need to go help. And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> uh, absolutely not. And he's like, I, I'm a Marine and I'm an Afghan veteran. Like, this is, and I thought, you know, man, how could I tell? Yeah. He has the same burden in his heart as me. He wants to help. How could I tell him no in the rest yeah. of his life? He, so uh, you know, got him, got him involved in a, in a just some great guys, uh, Sean G, uh, man, and uh, so we, as we set this up, we put together our team, and we we're just going to get him. The, the original plan was him, his wife, and six kids, but one of the other guys were like, "Hey, there's this group of thirty five hundred orphans. Like, let, let's get as many people as we can. Let's get as many Americans. Let's get as many w- women, children, and uh, interpreters, <clears throat> and families, Christians that be persecuted. Uh, we have the we have the right team and right." My mindset to do this like we all felt really burdened to help and so uh that's when we, the, we got permission from joint chiefs to go on the airport which was a miracle uh, i think this is all divine by the way like there's no way we could have pulled this off um called the, the royal family and in, in, in uh the united Arab Emirates, told them our plan they gave us the humanitarian center wow uh to bring people to because you know we, we're not a state department we can't just bring people yeah. a lot of people are cute, like got mad at us like how could you just bring People out. I'm like, first of all, we had to get the man our manifest vetted by the Joint Chiefs and get cleared. Everybody we put on a plane, and then they had to go to humanitarian center for the State Department to clear them. Like, I can't bring people to the states, yeah. so it's a lot more difficult than people think. Yeah. Uh, and so the the royal family gave us that, and they said, "Well, if we have two C-17 planes, we'll give to you guys if you could fill them up, and we'll put the pilots." And then we, uh, Glenn Beck called uh, from from the Blaze. You know, he got on the radio and he raised a bunch of money and. He didn't. He thought he was going to raise a couple of thousand dollars. He ended up raising overall forty six million, but at that time, like twenty one million. He's like, "Holy shit! I, what, what do I do with it?" And I'm like, "You're going to start paying for planes, and we're going to put people on them." Twenty forty six total million. Yeah. Wow. And That's so, uh, so all this happened in like three days. So yeah. I'm like trying to organize and orchestrate this. Um, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to get on the plane and go to Kabul. Kabul. Uh, uh, the the ground team there was Tim Kennedy, C Spray. And a guy named Sean G. So three of them were the ones that were going outside the wire of Kabul. I was, uh, we had a guy on the ground at the airport manifesting all those flights. I was, myself, Dan, Joe, we were in Abu Dhabi, kind of orchestrating everything for Abu Dhabi, building the target list, sending them to the ground team, coordinating everything from there. So I was in Abu Dhabi during his evac. Uh, and then that lasted about 10 days. In that 10 days, we got out 12,000 people. Yeah, that's uh, and then, um, and then the Abbey Abigail blew up. Thirteen of our service members died, and we made it. You know, and the military started pulling out, and we made a decision as a team: like, we can't leave. Like, this Ameri- this the news said a hundred Americans. We knew there were thousands. To, it didn't matter if it's one, right? We don't leave an American behind, and we chose to stay. And uh, and us, loosely us, like I say, us loosely, like the, so many Ameri- incredible nonprofits kind of collaborated with us. And over the next two months, we got about another. 5,000 people out, so 17,000 total. Wow. And then we had made a decision to stay even longer because we had knew all the all the Afghans at that point that were running from the Taliban had pushed to the Panjir Valley, and they were uh, they were wanting to cross into Tajikistan. But in the Tajikistan area, if you're familiar with those mountains, they're like 25,000 foot peaks. You know, Himalaya mountains are you know, crazy, and and uh, and then they had the Panjir River, which is a Category Five river, ice melt water, like 30 in the 30s. Uh, and then you have the Russian military is on that border now because of what's going on because of the evacuation. The Ch- Chinese military is on the border, like Ch- Chinese special operations are there. The Tajikistan military and the Taliban. So if a family would try to go across there, they had the geographical obstacles. They got the, the physical threat of the Taliban, and all the other you know, Chinese and Russians. And so they needed someone to go on the other side and build routes out for them. And, uh, you know, that's 
what we know how to do, you know, route recon and fording reps and stuff like that. So, uh, so I, uh, was putting together this operation and, and, uh, made it, you know, I had to pick someone to go with me cause I wanted to keep it small and, uh, Dennis Price who's sitting over there. Um, you can't see him on camera. <laughs> I can see him. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe we can get him in between you two and uh, yeah, he, get the he, band back together. Yeah. He, uh, he, uh he had, I just had met him and knew of him through Re reconnaissance community. And, you know, he's like bit every, every level of scout sniper, like he taught at the SF, SF sniper school and Marine Corps and, and, uh, you know, the, the ASO level stuff. And he just had that, that skill set experience and, uh, he's a younger guy and, and sharp on this stuff. And I'm like, man, I wonder if his CEO who I'm friends with will cut him loose. Cause he had just went from active duty to reserve. So I just think it was worth a shot. Yeah. So I wrote, I uh, called the CEO, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tommy, Tommy Waller of third force recon company. And I was like, Hey, uh, will you cut Dennis price loose to do humanitarian work with me? Cause being in the reserves, he still needs permission. Cause nobody was allowed to go in Afghanistan. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll write up, write up a request and I'll run it up and see if it happens. And it got approved. That's, that's and, a, I mean, when does that happen? It, like, it never. doesn't. It that's doesn't. Amazing. Yeah. So he, uh, so Dennis and I hopped on a plane. We, we, we planned it, planned it out and we flew into Tajikistan. Yeah. As you guys know, I am a, uh, a gun advocate. I'm a two, a supporter, uh, I have been my entire life served in the military. I carry a gun with me pretty much everywhere. Um, and I recently came across and became a member of uh, USCCA, the United States Concealed Carry Association. Um, and I want to tell you about this uh, group because they're a phenomenal uh, patriotic company that uh, understands the advantages and the, the importance of carrying a concealed gun responsibly. Uh, one of the biggest issues, I think, with um, you know the, the anti-Second Amendment crowds these days is the... Um, that one of it's not understanding, you know, what, what it takes to, to carry a gun and, and really even how they function and, and what it is to shoot them. Um, but also assuming that people are carrying guns that have absolutely no idea what they're doing. What I love about USCCA, uh, is that they have, uh, 200 easy to understand videos that, uh, give you a lot of training. It's not just firearms training though. It's, uh, laws that are constantly changing. It's, uh, the legalities of if you find yourself in this situation, this is what's legal, this is what isn't. Um, you know, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process that gives you advice uh, and counsel uh, on how to operate a, a concealed weapon, both within the parameters of the law and also from a morality standpoint, uh, kind of the right way to go about it, which is a, a critical component. Um, speaking of the legality aspect, they also provide liability insurance. If you are a US USCCA member, uh, and you get into a confrontation where a concealed weapon is used, they provide uh, that that insurance uh, for that scenario, which to me is is priceless. Uh, and it's also uh, very necessary should you find yourself in that position. Uh, they have a 24-7 access network uh, to legal providers and attorneys in whatever state that you're located in, uh, in whatever uh, area that that, that uh, altercation takes place in, uh, that they assign you that person for that uh, that jurisdiction so that it's applicable with all of the statutes and laws of that area. Um, the, the initial uh, sign-up fee is, is as low as $29. Uh, they have different um, levels that you can go, one, two, and three, to become certified. Um, it, it's just it's a phenomenal company. If that's not enough, uh, they also, um, being a, a card-carrying member of the USCCA, you also get 30% off. Uh, brands like Sig Sauer, Galco leather holsters. I, I own both. I have a, a number of Galco leather holsters that I carry uh, some of my Sig Sauer guns in. And, and uh, so those are both two good brands, uh, as well as a subscription to Concealed Carry Magazine uh, to keep you up to date on all things Concealed Carry. Uh, and then again, I want to reiterate that self-defense liability insurance, which, uh, which is huge. So um, I, I think, you know, with the state of our, our country and where it's at, being a responsible citizen means that should you find yourself in a position to protect others, I think you should uh, put it on yourself to do that, and it's the right thing to do. You don't want to do that haphazardly, though. So, um, you know, I don't think everybody should just go out and gra grab a gun and not know what they're doing. I think responsible gun owners should carry guns and, and use them should they find themselves in that uh, that position and we all take it upon ourselves to be uh, the protectors of those who cannot uh, protect themselves and 
I think the USCCA is a phenomenal organization uh, that bridges the gap from, uh, you know, your average everyday civilian that wants to get involved to somebody who actually can be a protector and, and make a positive net difference in society. So uh, great group. Um, I'm honored to have their, their sponsorship. Uh, and that's uh, the United States Concealed Carry Association. If you go to uscca.com forward slash mic drop, you can get, get this process started, become a card carrying member along with 650,000 other card carrying members across the United States. Phenomenal organization. I can't uh, say enough good things about them. Uh, I am a card carrying member uh, and they're just a great organization. So again, that's uscca.com forward slash mic drop. To me, uh, and that, that's an example of like, I know the shit's possible, mm -hmm. you know, so the, oh, our hands are tied. No, it's it's out of my hands. I can't make that decision. Bullshit. Like the if, right if, leader with the courage. To yeah. Do like if, if they can pull that kind of shit off, then I don't want to hear you can't do anything. Yeah. Like you're the fucking United States government. Like you can do whatever the fuck you want. Almost, <laughs> yeah. uh, almost, <laughs> um, man, that's, that's such an incredible story. So now, uh, at this point, are there still, do you guys still have contacts of people that you're still trying to get out or is it pretty pretty well you've gotten out who who you know of that you can get out or, or everybody no, else not, not even close i mean I, I get emails every single day everyone on if you're friends with me on social media i'm sorry because you probably got emails like like people like anybody on my like in my friend list they're like people emailing like sending audio like, like please help me like they're wow. killed my brother like and at this point there's nothing we could do in afghanistan the, the state department has closed all doors yeah. uh to be able to to get people out and uh, then we still have 70,000 70, Afghan, I mean, Afghans that served with us. So they'd be contractually obligated by the United, the United States government is contractually obligated to get those guys out. Are, is there any official effort on uh, whether it's DOD or just United States government wise so, to still get those 70,000 people out? So here's what, here's what the State Department said. And uh, I, I think it's, what are we in now? We, uh I think I think in, I think they said this around in September, uh, but they, they they said I can't tell you the exact date, but they said that so that's not only seventy 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 five thousand, but their family members qualify too. So you're talking about three hundred thousand people that are vetted vetted. The United States government knows who they are. They qualify and contractually obligate to get them out. They said they're doing about a hundred and fifty to two hundred per week. So that would take about about thirty uh, years. No, about a hundred. It's about one hundred fifty years. Holy fuck. I'm <laughs> shitty at math. Yeah. yeah it's about 150 <laughs> years to get to get them out. So, uh, you know, at the, in, the, in the government, right, it sounds like, oh, wow, we're getting like 150, 200 a week out. Yeah. So let's take 150 years. These people will yeah. be long dead. Uh, Is there any rhyme or reason to the, the method that they're doing that with uh, as far as who, who's going first? Or is it just totally random? It's totally random. Uh, in fact, I don't personally, I don't even believe that that's happening. Oh. I, I believe they threw a number out there to say they're actually doing something. Doing something. I, I'm not seeing it happen. Uh, and uh, I don't know any mechanism for it to happen. Yeah. Are, are you I'm, in contact with uh, people back there that are trying to get out still? And yeah, my, my siblings, my parents. So they're all still there? Yeah, they're all still there. Uh, they cannot get a passport to uh, run away to Tajikistan or Uzbekistan or Pakistan because of the barbaric regime installed. They are afraid oh. if they go to the passport department, It'll or, red flag. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And yeah. then on the other hand, all these neighboring countries, they are not allowing migrants to come to their countries without a valid document. And uh, it's really so, challenging over there right now. Um, so is there any, uh, pl not plan, but I mean, is, is there any way for you to get them over here? Or? Uh, not right now. Right yeah. now because um, I myself, I'm paroled over here, so I'm waiting on my uh, the documents to be processed and everything. Then in the future, yeah, of course I will. <clears throat> I can only imagine that's, like, if I put myself in your shoes, it's got to be a little bittersweet being here then. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course you're ecstatic and, and relieved that you and your family and, and kids and everybody got out, but there's still... Like it, it would crush me if my parents were still there and, and, yeah. and knowing that they're stuck there, you know, like that would be fucking heartbreaking. It is, it is, yeah. it is. Every night uh, in the middle of the night when I remember it, only God knows what what I experience. You yeah. Know, it's, it's really difficult. Man, yeah, that's tough. So I'm really sorry. Try, to we're trying out. to cheer them up. We yeah. take them to, they've had a lot of their firsts, you know. But yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, speaking okay. of that, what what has been uh, living in America like now that you've been you've been here for uh, what? Uh, since almost a year, over a almost year, almost nine months. Or nine months. Yeah. 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 
What, what's the weirdest fucking thing that we eat that you're like, how do you eat that shit? <laughs> is, that, is there anything that falls into that category? <laughs> no, everything. I eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah. is, is there anything <laughs> surprising, I guess? You're like, what? Uh, the, the whole, uh, the last two decades in Afghanistan, you know, yeah. I'm raised between yeah. Americans over there. Yeah. Eating a bunch of, of MREs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> MREs, all yeah. kinds of I stuff. Did, yeah. I did take him skydiving twice. Yeah. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. He, 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 we, we, were, he was, we were about to go out and I'm about to jump out and yeah. Yeah. He's, he's took to the tandem instructor and he says, why'd you take, why'd you take me all from Afghanistan to kill me here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. The, uh, as far as your kids, has that been a, a pretty big culture shock for them? Uh, they were, my kids were raised, uh, more modern from yeah. the childhood, uh, and they li- really love it. They really like it. And, uh, that was one of their longest hope for yeah. all the kids to come, <laughs> come here, here yeah. now, since they were in the school, they have classmates, friends, and, yeah. you know, uh, friends in the neighborhood and, uh, the people in Texas are so welcoming and yeah. friendly and uh, it has uh, been really nice yeah. and comfortable yeah. everything yeah but it's, it's better that you're here than uh, like new york city for yeah. sure right? <laughs> yeah uh what's the, what's the most awkward thing that you've done in his house that you're like dude what the fuck are you doing like is it any, anything that way <laughs> like me, he, me yeah uh, well you know you know uh so can i tell him about meeting hatra yeah, yeah okay okay i want to ask his, his wife uh so in afghanistan you don't typically meet the women, especially other men don't meet the women, Afghan men, especially like an American, but he had met Kathy like on FaceTime and that FaceTime back then it was Yahoo messenger. Yeah. Right. But he, he had met Kathy before. And, and, uh, and so that was like a first experience for him. So he wanted me to meet Hatra, his wife. And, uh, Hatra is like super funny, by the way, she's like a great personality. But back then we were both, we were younger. And, and so it was like, they set up, he like set up this moment. And it was like so awkward because I'm like <laughs> sitting in the kitchen and he's going to introduce me and he's nervous. I'm nervous. And she like, is all wrapped up and she pops out real quick and she goes away. And so that's like my first time meeting her. It was like a real awkward thing. And it's like, yeah. uh, so it was a big deal. I met his wife and then, yeah. and, uh, and then over time, you know, you, you, you meet her a little bit more. Well now, you know, we, uh, the, you know, he gets out of Afghanistan. He's in Abu Dhabi. I'm in Abu Dhabi. I finally get the reunion, yeah. go to knock on his door, give him this big old bear hug. And, uh, we're both crying. And then his kids run up and they're like, Uncle Chad. And I start crying again, right? Man. And, uh, you know, they're, because uh, his kids call me uncle. And, um, and then across the, the room in, in, in the humanitarian center is Hatra. And, uh, and now she's got, her face is really covered. She has a scarf on, but uh, she, she does the, she's back like away. And she does the hand over her heart, you know, yeah. thing. Like, which is the, the Afghan jester for those, like, uh, unfamiliar. And uh, that, was, that was how I seen her there. Wow. And then fast forward, <clears throat> uh, nine months later, I'm coming back from Ukraine and they're waiting in my driveway in Texas to meet me. Yeah. And, uh, my, my, my core, the little one, he runs up with my dog and runs up to me and, uh, wraps his arms around me and I see Aziz and, and, uh, and Hatra walks up to me and gives me a giant hug and says, thank you, brother. Wow. And that was like the evolution of like that awkward moment to like her yeah. being at my house, give me a, a big hug That's amazing. and, uh, you know, being here in America, that was, that was really cool. It's, uh, it's like, Probably one of the most special oh, moments for me. And, yeah, and, uh, I mean, uh, yeah it, make, it gives me goosebumps kind of yeah. hearing about it. I mean, what, a, what an amazing uh, journey and, and moment to kind of uh, put it all together. You know, that's yeah, it's and then incredible. The, uh, I'll tell you one more funny thing about her, because in Kabul, if those <clears throat> been around Kabul, Kabul has no trees. And so she moves here. He, he's been all over, but yeah. she had never been outside of Kabul. Oh, wow. So she moves to Texas and there's trees everywhere. She thinks it's the jungle <laughs> and like something's going to jump out. She's hilarious. So she's like, uh, something's going to jump out and eat her. Yeah. And so he's out of town and, and I'm like, while he's out of town, I take the family, I take Hatra and the kids. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to take you guys to see a movie. You've never seen a movie theater before. You got to, you have to sit down, have popcorn yeah. and, and see a movie. So I'm a dummy. I take her to see Jurassic Park. Oh God. <laughs> Pants. <laughs> she thinks it's real. Yeah. yeah, so she's in the jungle, lives in the Still jungle. With, yeah, and yeah, that's a trip. Uh, any instances of like, uh, you said you wh- when you came home from Ukraine, he he was already at your house. Yeah, because he had he made it home like a day before me, right? Yeah, I was okay. trying to make it back from Ukraine. Like literally, I was like, I was driving all the way from like the eastern front, like by Kharkiv, and I like hadn't showered in like ten days. Cause we're like living on the road and I, and I drive all the way through, get to Poland, try to get to, uh, to the, the, um, the Krakow airport. 
And I'm like, man, I'm not going to get a chance to stop and shower. Like, this would be a horrible. People yeah. was going to be. But uh, I was not going to miss seeing yeah. him. So I'm like, these people are going to have to endure yeah. me stinking on the flight. But uh, I did get a chance to get a quick shower before. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I was like, I was so determined, like, trying to drive through in a border that Ukraine, man, yeah. you never know how long it's going to take to get through the border. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I made it. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, like you walk in and he's in your in your chair in the living room and you're like, hey, bro, that's, that's my chair. You get <laughs> they were wait they were waiting in the front yard. Yeah, uh, it was it was awesome. really cool. Yeah, that's wild. It was, it was like so surreal. Like, yeah. and he's in Texas and now he's like, he, he like walking around. He's got usually got cowboy boots yeah, and cowboy hat. Belt buckle and the whole bit. He, he, yeah, he <laughs> looks. Yeah, he looks like 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 Juan Lopez yeah. over here. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> like. Oh, that's fucking great. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I missed it. How how long were you in Abu Dhabi before, uh, from the time you got there until you came to America? Were you there for months? Nine yeah, months, right? nine months, almost nine months. Oh, shit. It was, some, it was some times that we were like, it was like. Not I mean, sure if he this, was going to get yeah, over Yeah, the it. State Department's, man, the State Department's so messed up on this. It's wow. uh, I mean, and, and then you got to look at who the, the military brought out. It, no hit to the military. The United States military did best they could with in impossible circumstances. But they were filling those planes up because they were told to with people they had no idea who they were. And they flew those people straight to the United States with no vetting. And, and, and they could walk right off in, in the population. But all of our SIVs and people like Aziz that were vetted were in these humanitarian centers around the world waiting. Wait, like, there's still some of them there. Wow. Like, this is bet. You know, August of 2021, there's a still and some and there, yeah. Or over a year. <laughs> and uh, the people that we know who they are, meanwhile, you know, we yeah. get, a, get a tangent, talking about the southern border, but like these are people that we know who they are, and we can't take them. Yeah. It's, it's a. Uh, That's ter fucking terrible. <clears throat> oh. Do you know a uh, total number of Afghans that, that uh, we as a country have been able to uh, evacuate from there since uh, it all kind of went downhill? <clears throat> you know, if, I, if I had to guess, I'd say 150,000. 150, if, if I had to guess a number and are, are they spread scattered all over or is there all over the world yeah. Uh, yeah, not there, just there, there some are in uganda in alabania in pakistan you abu dhabi humanitarian city some are uh, even they brought them into ukraine wow brazil uh, and brazil yeah you, you want to know a national security tragedy <laughs> as uh our commandos that we special forces trained commandos our SIVs that are stuck there in Afghanistan uh, that we won't do the right thing and take out. You know who's taking them out and giving them citizenship? Russia. Really? And uh, Russia's like, we will free you from the Taliban. We'll take you and your family, give you citizenship here. Come fight for us against the Ukraine. I mean, why would they not? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, mean I mean, they're going to, yeah, like, my kids, my daughters are going to get raped by the Taliban, or I just go fight for these people? Yeah, yeah I'll go. For, uh, so I mean, I, it's it's a national security tragedy. Like, oh, it is. I mean, there's so many fumbles; it's hard to even keep track. Um, I can't imagine being a uh, being taken from Afghanistan uh, or you know evacuated from there and then being put into Ukraine. It's like you're trading one fucking thing for the next, but it's colder. I don't know. Yeah. Like, fuck. Like the, what, what a shit sandwich that is. Care about your, you know, it's for your family. You know, like, yeah, a, man, I can't yeah. even imagine it. it it's such a healthy dose of um, valuable perspective to hear your story. Um, and I can't thank you enough for everything that you've done uh, for this country and, and, and you, Chad, for yeah. doing everything to, uh, to help him and his family and, and everybody else. And the fact that you guys would come here and share the story because it's fascinating. And it's one that, um, especially in the backdrop or on the backdrop of um, all of the uh, – fumbles and fuck-ups that the United States government has uh, managed to pull off uh, in the last couple of years. The fact that you guys managed to uh, swim upstream and, and pull all that off is uh, is amazing, and I, I couldn't be happier and prouder to, to know you guys. Uh, thanks, man. Um, is there anything else that you want to uh, kind of share before uh, before we wrap it up? Uh, wait. With Dennis, you started swimming upstream with Dennis here. I'd just give a prop to Dennis. Yeah. Uh, uh, you want to come on camera for a minute? Or can you? I don't know. Yeah, if I can send send in between the guys, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the Marine Corps. You know, when I did that after action report, you know, we, uh, I mean, we spent ten days there. We did ninety miles of border recon. That, and, cou uh, that couch suddenly doesn't look that fucking big. <laughs> 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 fucking casting couch over there. <laughs> What's really going on here at the Mike Drop Studio? Yeah, we did. You know. T T uh, 90 miles of border reconnaissance and uh, built six routes across the river and swam across that river in Afghanistan and you know, across that water. And uh, 
And when I sent that after, you know, at times we, we even got a picture. We we're like 30, 30 yards away from Taliban wow. at, at night. And, uh, and sent that after action report back to Lieutenant Colonel Waller. And he's like, oh, dude, you're going to get me fired. And, yeah. uh, and I'm like, man, we got we to gotta recognize this guy. Because he, yeah. he, it was one point he took high ground to, uh, for this route in broad daylight and got shot at twice. Man. Got pushed off the mountain and then chose, we chose to, to go across that river anyway that yeah. day. And, uh, and, uh, and so... Lieutenant Colonel Waller did the right thing, nominated him for an award, and he's going to be getting um, the Navy Marine Corps Medal, which is the highest oh, wow. peacetime medal. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. In, 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 uh, well deserved. Gives out. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. super cool. Um, how how was that experience for you um, from all the time that you spent on active duty to, to go in to do that? What was that like? Yeah, so at the time, uh, I just transferred out of active duty probably like five months ago. And I yeah. served almost 15 years. Uh, so honestly, it was super easy it was yeah. like we i've been doing this yeah. my whole my whole life yeah uh so we got an objective we had a mission uh we knew the right thing to do and then um i had someone almost the same exact background uh and we just trusted in god and, and did the right thing what needed to be done uh looking back at some of the, the situations you know there's a lot of hairy ones but when you're faced over there and you have no other choice and you have human lives or americans or you know, uh, SIVs who are vetted, who you've been working with and approved. Uh, when when you have nothing else, you have you have to do it. Yeah. You know, you don't you don't you don't have any other choice. Yeah. It's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Wow. You know, and if not you, then who? And obviously, we saw uh, no one came. Yeah. You know, there was like uh, when we got out there, we didn't expect what we you know he it's just him, me and him, and we get out there, we chose not to have weapons with us because of there's so much security. We get I mean, we got you know, every checkpoint. And, and uh, we even got detained in one checkpoint. But, uh, I mean, there was so much, like, uh, Russian presence, like, Russian mechanized vehicles, Chinese, like, uh, Chinese mechanized infantry with, like, BMPs on, with PKMs, with giant spotlights for people crossing the river. And and then we saw, you know, several, like, very well camouflaged Chinese snipers uh, with Dragonoffs. And it was, they were Dude, super legit out there. It's like the United Colors of Benetton of fucking combat edition. It's like, we, like we are the fucking world. But, like, that's amazing that there's, and that was largely uncovered. I mean, it's the first time I've, I've really heard that. Yeah. Uh, there's a one story uh, that I don't know what... We ran so many operations at the time because um, we were trying to build 90 miles of uh, border operations for uh, deep reconnaissance um, and then fording reps to that whole thing. So I don't remember. It was towards the end. Um, it was me and Chad. We were going and we identified uh, an area in the Panch River that looked feasible to cross. Um, it looked relatively good on the peaks uh, because the, the terrain there is nothing that you could ever see unless you went. I don't know, the Alps or something. Um, it was the harshest terrain I've ever seen. And uh, there's class five rapids, especially extremely cold. So we, we keep traveling and we found a spot that we think is viable. It looked pretty good um, from that area. It's at night, no MVGs, night vision goggles. Um, and we pull off and I'm like, hey, pull over to the side right here. We did um, uh, foot patrols to, um, you know, to cover 90 miles. You have to, we did uh, um, both. So I get out, I do... Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, it's a two-man operation, so I'm doing kind of like a point man thing, and he's kind of running dual point behind me. Uh, so I get out with, you know, typical, like, SOP is uh, fives and 25s. I clear my immediate front, five feet in front of me, uh, you know, uh, and then 15, you know, um, uh, or sorry, 25 uh, yards in front of me uh, from there. And I, I pinpoint in my head the direction. I'm like, okay, here's the river. This looks like a good spot. Um, I'm going to lead it down there. I do a quick uh, check at night. No night vision goggles or anything. So we, when we pulled over the side, I'm like, hey, this spot looks good. Here's a big bush. We're covered and concealed from the highway. You know, we have a relatively good position that we can stage uh, ourselves, rope bridge across, stage others, and swim across. Um, so as we get closer, we, we start getting, um, moving towards um, the river. And all of a sudden, um, I see, like, moving off to the side, and, and Chad grabs me by the scruff of the neck, throws me in the vehicle, and in, like, slow motion, I, like, look up, and that bush, and this is, like, the most, this is, I, I beat myself up all of the time about this. It was, because yeah. uh, I was a sniper instructor, um, you know, for SF Sniper. <laughs> uh, I, I, I teach pre-sniper for, like, 12 years, yeah. target indicators, you know, uh, shine outline, contrast background, all this stuff. So as he's throwing me in the vehicle, uh, I, like, look up, and there's this, um, this Chinese soldier like gillied up and that bush, it was, 
it was actually not a bush. Uh, it was like World War II um, German tank style. It was this, what was it a BMR, right? Yeah. yeah. A BMR uh, with like bushes all on top and the, the, the Chinese soldier was all gillied up and he was from me to you going in for the capture. So I, I look up in like slow motion and he's, as he's throwing me in the vehicle, we slams in the, uh, the door behind us is like, go, go. And we peel off and I look over in slow motion, just see the tent. And I, that's when it like the, like the true reality was like, yeah. oh my God. And I, immediately when I, when like probably 500 down, yards down the road, I just start beating myself up. I'm like, man, I, I was like, I can't believe I did that. Yeah. I was like, I teach this stuff. I was like, yeah. I live this stuff, like silhouette. Like I was like, what caught your eye? And, um, what would you say that one was? It was like the old man with uh with bad eyes. Yeah. So, but it was just the I, I when I first picked up one it was like just the shape was like it was like square, you know, it was like a square shape and I and I was like I was like I lost track I was him and I was just like staring at it and then I seen the guy. When I seen the guy, he's like coming towards us and I could you know it was I Man, I'm surprised he didn't fucking shoot. Yeah, well I think he probably didn't know what to do, you know. Yeah. Like a uh, I mean, it, and it was a, such a contrast to people. There would be like Chinese soldiers, like rock kickers, you know, rifle slung over their back, just walking on the road. But then there were guys like him. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, if you're in that position on that road, you like yeah. get myself in trouble. Like, do I just, is there, yeah. you know, I shoot the wrong person. I don't yeah. think he knew what to do. And yeah. the drive, I was just like, go <laughs> drive. Fuck, like, that's a close call, yeah. man. I mean, yeah. I wonder what, what would have happened? Like, I, I, I think it, it was smarter uh at the time to to grab us because he if he if he killed us like th there's no information there yeah and i always say now uh so chad's the the godfather to my youngest now because yeah. i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him yeah. i would be um i'd be in a torture camp or I'd, I'd be dead or even worse in a torture camp you know and pulling all of the information and come out with like if i came alive no no fingernails and yeah. teeth and whatever else god dang man that's some hairy shit gentlemen Wow, what a fucking story! Any, uh, I guess, from your perspective after that, did you guys uh, do the, or, or what happened after that? I guess after the. Uh, so vehicle? yeah, um, we continued on. We slept uh, the river that night. We slept was that the, we slept the same the night? River that night? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. We eventually slept uh, by the river, like ninety miles. We we cleared out of there for a few hours, and we kept uh, moving on, and then we slept next to a, ri a river. Um, and then we eventually just kept, we had to, we had to do, just because you have a, a, a scary incident, the mission still need to be done. Yeah. So we, we, we grabbed uh, like four or five other uh, checkpoints, and then we eventually built the plan and executed it. Wow. There was a, I think that whole operation, like like HKIA, like my wife knew, because uh, I was more coordinated, everything there. And, and even if I went to the airport, she was like, oh, you're putting people in planes. It's not like a big deal. She didn't feel like that. But like when, she, when I was getting dropped off at the airport to go do that, she's like, I know what you're going to do. You're going to go into Afghanistan. Why are you going to do this? And uh, and I'm, she's like, why aren't the military doing this? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good question. Like, I shouldn't be doing this. The military should be. They're way more qualified. Like, I'm not some, yeah. like, break, you know, old school guy, like, breaking, you know, in case of emergency. Like, there's better guys. Fucking John Rambo <laughs> over here. There's, there's yeah. much better yeah. guys. You, you and I both know that, that that could do this. But they wouldn't be allowed to. And, and yeah. so it's like, I was telling my wife, like, we have to. We're the next best choice as the veterans. And, uh. You know, luckily I'm going with Dennis, who's younger and, and the next generation of recon guys. And knees and, doesn't your knees don't hurt. Your back's not yeah. tucked up. Or not <laughs> no, yet. No, it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's already just not as bad. <laughs> yeah. It's not 20 years so, of it. Right. But I was just telling my wife, like, I'm like, what if this what if this was us? Like, what if this was <clears throat> us? It was our daughter. It was going to be raped for the rest of her life. If it was our kids, that our boys would be, you know, forced into Taliban. Wouldn't we be praying someone would come help us? Yeah. You know, and that's kind of I think where he and I shared that. And And, and by the way, like. All those guys that was on that first operation, like uh, all the guys that even outside of Saber Allies that helped, you know, it's it just I think everybody was like, hey, we need to do the right thing. Yeah. One, one of my um, good friends, and if you, if you watch a documentary or read the book, Sea Spray, he's a uh, you know one of the most amazing human beings uh, as far as operator I've ever met. And he was getting interviewed recently, and he said the same thing Dennis just said, like, why why are you guys doing this? And it was about, more about Ukraine, but he was one of the main guys in Afghanistan. You know, why are you guys, you don't know these people, they're not from your country, like, why would you go risk your life to do this? And he said, you know, same thing as Dennis, it's, it's the right thing to do, yeah. which is true, right? It's the right thing to do. But then they asked him another question. They said, uh, the reporter said, is it worth it? And he said, it doesn't have to be. Like, it doesn't have to be worth it to do the right thing. And yeah. uh, and I thought that was pretty profound because, yeah. you know, like the ROI on it, people like, 
people were like bashing, you know, Tim Kennedy, uh, me, him, like, like, why are you guys good? This is crazy. Like it's cowboy stuff. I'm like, like, do I not want to get hurt? Of course I don't want to die. Of course I don't want to get hurt. But am I so naive with all my experience and not know the risk? Of course I know the risk. Uh, but man, I, I would hope someone come help my daughter or yeah. kid, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Amen on that. hundred yeah. percent, man. It's, uh, an incredibly noble thing uh, that all of you guys have done. I, uh, you know, I'm honored to sit here with you. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. Aziz, thank you uh, on behalf of the United States. Not that I speak for him, uh, but I'm going to try and uh, say thank you, you know, for everything that you and your family has done. Uh, both you two gentlemen as well, yeah. um, hanging it out there and, and doing what's right uh, on behalf of the American people is something that uh, we should all and are very, very proud of you guys for. So thank you for, for doing it and come, coming and sharing it. Thank uh, you so much. For you guys, Saving Aziz is the book. A thousand percent get it. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it's an incredible story, and there's, of course, a lot more to uh, the story that's in the book that we didn't talk about today. Um, but thank you guys for uh, for listening. Amazing story. Um, honored to, to be able to, to bring it to you on this platform. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and until next time, this is Mike Drop.